Hello and welcome to my limited set review for Innistrad Midnight Hunt. The grades, as always, will be available for all patrons and Twitch subscribers on a nice handy spreadsheet. Once the set review is finished, I'm gonna keep that spreadsheet up to date as always as I play the set more and we get a bit more information on how cards interact and which cards may be better than expected and which cards a little bit worse. And of course, all my other spreadsheets for all my other limited uh, sets are also available on my Discord. First off, let me go over how I like to grade cards. I use a letter grade system similar to author content creators, which makes it easier to compare notes. So all the way at the top, we've got the S tier and to compare cards from the Forgotten Realms expansion, Ranger class comes to mind as one of these S tier cards that can take over a game by itself and is often very difficult to interact with for the opponent. Next up we get to the A tier, which are still bomb level cards. We've got Gelatinous Cube for instance, 4 mana 4-3 four, that can kill a creature when it enters a battlefield. And another card that comes to mind is Mind Flare, no pun intended, another great 2 for 1. These are the A tier cards. Next up we've got the B tier, these are the great playables. These are still cards that will heavily pull you into their colors. Often we'll find the best commons at this grade. Think of Dragon's Fire in Forgotten Realms, probably the best common in the set. Just great efficient instant speed removal. We've got nice 2 for 1 creatures like Owlbear. These might also sneak up into the B category. So great playables that you're happy to first pick. Next we get to the C plus category. I like to divide the C in C and C plus just because there are so many C level cards. So C plus are the good playables that very rarely will get cut if you're playing those specific colors. Think of Arborea Pegasus, just nice evasive creatures that sometimes have uh, better stats than average. And a card like Faraday's Fireball, a removal spell that may be a little bit more pricey than you would find at the B tier, but still gets the job done. So still happy to play it in almost every red deck. So that's the C plus type card. The major bulk of uh, cards will be around the C tier. So these are, you know, playable cards. Sometimes you'll end up uh, playing them. Sometimes they don't make the cut since you have more cards of a higher grade that are a little bit better. But uh, you're still not embarrassed to play these. Cards like the Frost Giant, cards like the Bull Strength, so Combat Tricks will often fall in the C tier for me. Cards that you're sometimes happy to play if you're an aggressive creature deck, but you usually don't need to prioritize them during the drafts. And then at the D tier we find Bad Filler cards. These are cards that will get cut from your deck more often than not, and you're pretty unhappy if you have to main deck these. Cards like Devour Intellect, Discard Effects will often fall in this category, especially if they're not targeted. And cards like Silver Raven, just creatures that aren't very high impact and that needs very specific synergies before they become worthwhile. And then last but not least, we've got the F tier. There's not that many F tier cards in Limited these days. They often are sideboard cards for Constructed that just don't have any Limited applications or cards that are just super narrow or just fun build arounds for constructed like Minion of the Mighty. So these are the unplayable cards, but again there's not a whole lot of these in limited nowadays. So this is my grading system that I'll be using for Midnight Hunt. So now we've got a better idea where these grades are coming from. So let's get started with our first cards from Innistrad. And I usually like to start out with the multicolor cards first, just because that will give us a better idea what all the color pairs in Limited are trying to accomplish. So let's get started with Angel Fire Ignition. Three mana rare sorcery, puts two plus one plus one counters on target creature, gains Vigilance, Trample, Lifelink, Indestructible, and Haste until end of turn. And we can even flash it back out of the graveyard, flashback, a keyword that will appear many times in the set. So yeah, Angel Fire Ignition seems like a great limited card, gives you a lot of stats spread out over two activations, and the combination of keywords is pretty overwhelming, plus you get that permanence plus one plus one counter bonus as well. 
So Angel Fire Ignition seems great and gets an A from me. Just a powerhouse card that I'm happy to kind of build my red-white aggro deck around. Next up we have Arcane Infusion, 2 mana, instant and uncommon. Get to look at the top 4 cards of our library, reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them and put it into our hand. And the rest goes on the bottom, also has flashback for 5 total. So Arcane Infusion is a pretty narrow card that only really fits into this blue rats spells archetype that wants to play a lot of instants and sorceries, as many as you can fit into the deck realistically. So outside of the hyper synergistic blue red spells deck, Arcane Infusion is not particularly playable, just because an average limited deck only has so many instants and sorceries, so your hit rate with Arcane Infusion is going to be pretty low. But if you are that very synergistic blue red spells deck, then I could see Infusion doing some good work. But uh, in general, I'm going to give this a C. Next we have Arlin, the Pax Hope, 4 mana Planeswalker. Starts out at 4 loyalty, and immediately we are confronted with one of the new mechanics in Innistrad, which is the Daybound mechanic. So in Innistrad we have a day and night cycle, but the day and night cycle only appears if we play a card with Daybound or another card that specifically calls for it becoming day or night. And once it becomes day, all werewolves that have a day side will enter the battlefield as their day side werewolf. And uh, the way it turns into night is if the active player doesn't cast any spells in their turn, then on the next upkeep it will transform to night and all daybound permanents will switch to their night side and all future creatures that are daybound or nightbound will enter the battlefield on their backside. And then the way it switches back to daytime is if the active player casts two spells in their turn, then on the following day it's almost as if the people in the village are waking up because there's a lot of activity, so it goes from nighttime back to daytime if you cast two spells in the active player's turn. So that's how these will flip back and forth. And Arlen the Pax Hope is very powerful. The plus one says until your next turn you may cast creature spells as though they had flash. Each creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. And then the minus three is what we're most interested in, creates two, two, two green wolf creature tokens. So we're gonna play Arlen if it's the uh, daytime at least and generate those two wolf tokens right away. They can protect our planeswalker. And then the backside of Arlen, the night bounce side, is still a planeswalker that can plus to add red and green to our mana pool or can use a zero ability and until end of turn Arlen turns into a 5-5 werewolf creature with trample, indestructible and haste. So that's just an overwhelming amount of stats that you're throwing at the opponent. You can ramp, you can just generate a board presence. Pretty powerful card no matter which day or night side uh, Arlen ends up as, especially if you can flip it back and forth a few times. So yeah, Arlen gets an S grade from me. Just an absolute bomb that's going to be very difficult to deal with, especially when played on curve. Next up we have a blade stitched scab, 2 mana for a 2-3 zombie soldier in blue-black, saying other zombies you control get plus 1 plus 0. So blue-black, as we'll notice, has a pretty big zombie theme. It makes those decayed zombie tokens, as we'll encounter soon. Those are zombies that get sacrificed at the end of combat, and they also cannot block, so you want to be turning those zombies sideways. So giving them one extra power is quite relevant, and the scam will be very important in those blue-black zombie decks. And uh, yeah, in those decks definitely gets a B-grade, a card you want to try and take early and sort of build around. Can stay away, 2 mana sorcery at rare, says return target creature card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and it gains if it would die, exile it instead. And then we can also flash it back for 5 mana. So we're not really getting a huge mana discount on the creature we're reanimating. It's more of a value card to get back an important creature. And of course a flashback means that this could potentially be a 2 for 1. Still not super thrilled by Can't Stay Away. It's a fine card, but uh, probably just a C plus and nothing more. Corpse Cobble, 2 mana instant in blue-black. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice any number of creatures. 
And we get to make an X-Axe, a blue and black zombie creature token with menace, where X is the total power of the sacrificed creatures. So the idea with Corpse Cobble is that it's a way for us to sacrifice or decayed zombies that would maybe go away anyways, or aren't particularly impressive by themselves. We can maybe even cast it at instant speed during the opponent's turn, sacrifice a few of our zombies that cannot block, and actually make an XX blue and black zombie that is able to block right away. So that can potentially set up an ambush, and then flashback means we can potentially get a bit of value out of it from the graveyard too for five mana that is. So yeah, Corpse Cobble seems decent. In the blue-black deck that can make a lot of decayed tokens, outside of that deck it's not particularly exciting. Can maybe sacrifice a creature that's being enchanted by an opposing removal spell, but there's not a whole lot of those in the set. So overall Corpse Cobble gets a C, but in a very dedicated decayed deck I could see it going up in value, but not a card that a ton of decks are going to want. Croaking Counterpart, 3 mana sorcery at rare, creates a token that's a copy of target non-frog creature, except it's a 1-1 one, one green frog. Can also flash it back for 5 mana. So with Croaking Counterpart, if we want to get a lot of value out of it, we want to try and copy creatures that have sweet enter the battlefield abilities, I suppose. Because the 1-1 one, one frog is not particularly impressive, but if we can get some good ETB effects, it gets a lot better. So you want to be on the lookout for those. And blue-green does have a decent amount of sweet enter battlefield abilities to get you a lot of value. And then the flashback is just gravy, but a pretty fun card overall. Gets a C from me as well. Downheart Wardens, 3 mana for a 3-3 human warlock at uncommon. In green-white it has vigilance and has the new keyword, coffin which is a keyword that appears on a number of cards. It appears on creatures, but also instants or activated abilities. So it's a keyword that cares about you controlling three creatures that have different powers. So in this case, at the beginning of combat on our turn, if we control three or more creatures with different powers, creatures we control get plus one plus zero so until end of turn. So important to note about Coven is that it triggers twice. First, it triggers to see if you control those three creatures. If you do, the trigger goes on the stack, and then once the ability resolves, it will check again. Do you have those three creatures with different powers? If you do, then the ability happens, and in this case, our creatures get that plus one plus so bonus. So the opponent can still potentially respond by killing one of your creatures in response to the trigger, and then the ability will not resolve properly. And for activated abilities, it's a little bit different, as we'll see. In that case, once you activate the ability, it doesn't matter if the opponent kills your creature in response, it's still on the stack and it will resolve. But for abilities on creatures like the Wardens, that's the way it works. So as far as the Wardens is concerned, pretty solid creature. 3-3 three, three Vigilance for 3 is already above the curve in terms of uh, stats, and then the Coven ability on top makes it even better. So this gets a B from me, a card I'm pretty happy to take early and sort of build my green-white deck around. And green-white, as we'll see, also able to make a lot of tokens, so the additional power bonus is going to be very relevant. Next up we have a Danic a Pious Apprentice, 2 mana for a 2-3 legendary human soldier at rare in blue-white, has lifelink, and says cards and graveyards cannot be the targets of spells or abilities. So it's kind of protecting your graveyard, as we'll see blue-white cares a lot about getting creatures back from the graveyard with the disturb mechanic, which also appears on Danik, which is in this case 4 mana. So the disturb mechanic lets you cast a creature from the graveyard for its disturb cost, and instead of getting the front half of the creature back, you get the backside instead, which in this case is Danik Pious Apparition. So for 4 mana with a Disturb out of the graveyard, we can cast the Pious Apparition, which is a 3-2 flyer, saying whenever one or more creature cards are put into graveyards from anywhere, investigate. Investigate means we get to make a clue token, which is an artifact we can sacrifice for 2 mana to draw a card, and this ability only triggers once each turn. And then as all Disturb creatures, uh, once they die, instead of going back to the graveyard, they get exiled instead. So blue-white cares about Disturb, then it will protect your Disturb creatures so they aren't uh, messed with by potential graveyard hate. And then both the front half, 2-3 lifelink for 2, 
and the Disturb Path, a 3-2 flyer with upside that can provide card advantage, are pretty efficiently costed. So Danik is quite powerful and gets an A from me. Bomb level card that's just incredibly efficient and provides a lot of value. And as we'll see here, we've got another Disturb card in blue-white, Devoted a Graph Keeper. A 2-1 for 2 mana, that when it enters the battlefield mills 2 cards. And milling yourself in this set is definitely an advantage between all the Disturb creatures and flashback cards. So it should be seen as an advantage, there's not going to be a lot of decks that win by milling you out. And whenever we cast a spell from our graveyard, we get to tap target creature we don't control. So that applies to both Disturb as well as Flashback. So if we can cast anything at instant speed with Flashback, we can potentially prevent an opposing creature from attacking. Otherwise, it's more of an offensive ability to get blockers out of the way. And the Disturb cost is also quite efficient here on the Graph Keeper. Three mana to play it out of the graveyard. And it will turn into Departed Soul Keeper, a 3-1 flyer and it can only block creatures with flying, so it's definitely more of an offensive card. And then if it dies, it gets exiled. So yeah, the Graph Keeper slash Soul Keeper, pretty efficient card, sets up more of your Disturb synergies by potentially milling more creatures into your graveyard, and also gets a B for me, just a very solid card. Next is a Dire Strain Rampage, a 3 mana, a rare sorcery in red-green, and this is a bit of a weird one. It says, destroy target artifact, enchantment, or land. If a land was destroyed this way, its controller may search their library for up to two basic land cards, put them on the battlefield, tapped, and shuffle. Otherwise, if we destroyed an enchantment or an artifact, the controller may search their library for a basic land card and put it on the battlefield, tapped, instead. So the way we should look at the Darren Strain Rampage is more of a ramp card as opposed to a disenchant effect. So I think the main application is going to be pointing this at your own land and then you get to search for two basic lands, so you essentially netted one extra land. So it's a way of ramping. And then later in the game perhaps, with flashback for five mana, we can uh, point this at an opposing enchantment or artifact that might be problematic. And then the opponent sure gets to find a land, but hopefully at that point in the game it doesn't matter too much. There's not too many incentives for ramping in the set. You're usually happy to just curve out, and uh, Red Green cares more about werewolves than it really does about ramping. So, yeah, not particularly impressed by the Rampage. Probably a better sideboard card if your opponent has some powerful artifacts or enchantments you need to deal with. So, it gets a D, but uh, again, keep its various applications in mind. A Diagraph Rebirth is a 5 mana sorcery at Uncommon in Black Green says it costs one less to cast for each creature that died this turn. So if you have a, a big fight, maybe some of your decades zombie tokens died, this can easily become very cheap, even as cheap as just two mana. And then you get to return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So we've often seen these five mana reanimation effects, although at five mana they're usually not impressive. If we can get this at a discount, it does get a lot more appealing, and it even has flashback for 7 mana, and the flashback cost also, of course, will get the discount, so we can even technically flash it back for just 2 mana if 5 creatures died somehow. But uh, yeah, the rebirth, a lot better than the typical reanimation effects, black green, as we'll see, pretty good at filling the graveyard, also just cares about having a full graveyard more than other color combinations. So I don't mind the Diagraph Rebirth too much. I think I'm gonna end on a B for Rebirth, just because of the value it can potentially hold, especially considering we can potentially just randomly put it in our graveyard and get a value from the flashback without ever needing to draw it. Faithful Mending, blue-white instant at uncommon, says you gain two life, draw two cards, and then discard two cards. We're just doing a bit of card filtering, maybe getting rid of lands we don't need, and I guess discarding in blue-white has the advantage of potentially putting some of your disturbed creatures in the graveyard that you can then replay. Although the problem I have with Faithful Mending is usually these looting effects are good for discarding lands, but in a deck with a lot of Disturbed creatures, you're usually going to be able to use all that mana in the late game by casting your Disturbed creatures out of the graveyard. So you're not necessarily uh, in the market for discarding lands. 
as you might be in a more aggressive low curve deck. And then we can also flash back the Faithful Manning for three mana once again. So the life gain is nice, the filtering, you know, is useful, but we're still, you know, paying a card for that effect and we're not necessarily getting a card of value back. So not a huge fan of the Faithful Mending, gets a D for me. Next is Flash Taker, two mana for a 2-2 Human Assassin at Uncommon in black-white. And as we'll see, black-white cares about sacrificing creatures. It says whenever you sacrifice another creature, you gain one life and scry one. And we can pay one mana and sacrifice another creature at any time. And then the Flash Taker gets plus two plus two until end of turn. So pairs nicely with any decayed zombie tokens that we might have laying around. And uh, yeah, Flash Taker, the threat of activation is always there. Makes it pretty difficult for the opponent to attack into it. If you've got some expendable tokens, you can sacrifice at a moment's notice. And can also deal a lot of damage to potentially close out the game out of nowhere. So yeah, Flush Taker also gets a B, one of the centerpieces of a black-white sacrifice deck. Next is Florian, Voldaren, Scion, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, Legendary Vampire Noble at rare, in red-black, has first strike, and says at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, we can look at the top X cards of our library, where X is the total amount of life your opponents lost this turn, and exile one of those cards, and the rest goes on the bottom, and you may play the Exiled card this turn. So it can potentially provide extra card advantage turn after turn. Red Black Vampires is a very aggressive color pair that uh, can easily get damage in, so plays well with the ability. And uh, of course card advantage, always useful for those aggressive decks that might run out of cards sooner than other color pairs. So yeah, Florian kind of does it all, just a very efficiently costed creature, 3-3 three, three first strike for 3 mana is already quite powerful, and that ability is just gravy. So Florian gets an A. And next is a Galvanic Iteration, a 2 mana instant and rare in the Izzet colors, and says when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell, and you may choose new targets for the copy. This is an effect we've seen a number of times in previous expansions, but this one has the upside of also having flashback for three mana. So can potentially accumulate quite a bit of value, especially if we have some cheaper instants and sorceries, we can copy with it, since it's gonna be kind of tricky to copy very expensive spells, given that we have to pay all the additional mana of the iteration on top of it. But yeah, alongside some Cheap removal spells perhaps, getting to double those is quite nice. Again, referencing some sort of blue-red spells deck that has a ton of instants and sorceries. Then I could see Iteration being pretty decent and a nice value card. Still doesn't strike me like a particularly high pick. So I think I'm going to land somewhere around a C for Galvanic Iteration. But uh, a card that could be quite a bit of fun if it works out. Next is a Ghoul Colors Harvest, a 2 mana sorcery at rare in Golgari Colors. Creates X 2 2 black zombie creature tokens with Decayed. So, this is our first sighting of Decayed zombies. And X is half the number of creature cards in your graveyard, around it up. And a creature with Decayed cannot block, and when it attacks, sacrifice it at the end of combat. So, as you may know, after the damage step, there's this end of combat step, which is when the creature will get sacrificed, and then you move to your second main phase. And uh, as we mentioned, Golgari, a color combination that will be pretty good at filling the graveyard and cares about having a full graveyard. And this also has flashback for five mana to potentially replay it once again. So yeah, in a Golgari deck that's good at filling the graveyard and has some use for all those zombie tokens, which is not a guarantee, because you know sometimes you make a couple zombies, the opponent has good blockers available, or they just take four or six damage and uh, they can kind of brush it off since the zombies will be gone at the end of combat. Then uh, the harvest is not necessarily all that exciting, but uh, in a deck with a few sacrifice effects or other ways to make use of those zombies, the harvest is going to be a pretty nice way to generate them. Still not an incredibly high pick, probably falls somewhere around the sea. Next is a grizzly ghoul, 4 mana for a 4-3 zombie bear at uncommon in black green with Trample, and when a ghoul enters the battlefield, it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it for each creature that died this turn. 
The worst case scenario is a 4-3 trample for 4, which is not exciting, but also not a disaster. If, let's say, two creatures trade, then two creatures died, this will enter as a 4-mana 6-5 trampler, which is, you know, quite efficient, definitely above the curve in terms of power and toughness. So, Grizzly Ghoul has potential. I don't expect this to be much larger than a 6-5 typically, but uh, on a rare occasion, maybe in the late game if you've got a bigger board presence, this could come out as a, a very large trampler. So Grizzly Ghoul probably gets a C+, plus as definitely an above average creature, maybe not quite in the B tier, because the opponent can potentially play around it to prevent you from getting a very large bear. Next is Hallowed Respite, a 2-mana sorcery at rare in blue-white. Can exile target a non-legendary creature, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So we're essentially flickering a creature. If it entered under our control, we can put a plus one plus one counter on it, otherwise we tap it. So we get a plus one counter. If we flicker an opposing creature, we get to tap it, so... I don't know if the flickering is going to be all that relevant, but the tapping might be. I guess flickering potentially relevant if the opposing creature has any plus one counters on it. That will then fall off. That being said, is Hallowed Respite worth a card? It's a sorcery, so we cannot even use it in the opponent's turn to prevent an attack. It does have flashback for three mana, so we do get to do it twice. But um, I'm still skeptical of how good Respite will be. While there are a few creatures with ETB effects, you'll need some pretty good ones for Respite to be worth it. And again, the sorcery speed does limit its applications, can't really use it to save a creature from removal, for instance. Maybe there's a deck out there with some awesome ETB effects, and then uh, you might still consider it. Otherwise, I think I'm gonna give this a D. Hungry for More is a 2-mana sorcery in red-black at Uncommon. Creates a 3-1 black and red vampire creature token with Trample, Lifelink and Haste, and we have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. can also flash it back for 3-mana. So while red-black is an aggressive color pair, I'm still not super excited about Hungry for More, just because typically we would prefer for our creatures to stick around on the battlefield so we can attack with them multiple times. If we cast Hungry for more on turn 2, we're very likely to deal 3 damage and gain 3 life. So it's kind of like a lightning helix to the face. But in limited, we're typically not going to have like a burn deck that can win a game without combat damage from actual creatures. And then once we get to the late game, the opponent might have some blockers available and the 3-1 doesn't even necessarily connect with the opponent. And on turn 2, when it does potentially connect, you would usually rather deploy an actual creature that can keep attacking multiple times. So there's just a lot of awkwardness surrounding Hungry for More to a point where I'm really not that interested in playing it. Maybe if you can sacrifice the vampire token after attacking with it, you can get some more uses out of it. In which case, I could see it making the deck, but on average, I don't think red-black aggro is going to want this. So I'm going to give it a D. And join the Dance, on the other hand, seems like a fine token maker. Two mana sorcery add on common in green-white, creates two 1-1 one, one white human creature tokens, and also has flashback for five mana. So yeah, this card seems pretty good, making 2-1-1 one, one tokens, great for the go white strategy. And uh, if you don't have any one-powered creatures, this can help you with Coven as well. And if you have any effects that can pump the team, the tokens will definitely benefit from it. So join the dance, seems like a C plus level card to me. Then we have Catilda, Dawnheart Prime, 2-mana, 1-1 one, one legendary human warlock at rare in the Celesnia colors and has protection from werewolves, which is of course incredibly relevant in a set full of werewolves, most of which are often very large, and having a 1-1 one -one that can block uncontested is quite nice. But uh, it doesn't stop there. Human creatures get to tap for mana, and uh, Catilda makes both green and white. So yeah, being able to ramp into bigger and more powerful things is always nice. And we even get a great mana sink here. At 6 mana we can tap Catilda to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature we control. 
So in a go wide deck that makes a whole bunch of tokens, those tokens will also be able to potentially pay for the activated ability, and then they'll also get bigger, so they all synergize very nicely with Catilda. Now, of course, if we use the ability for plus one counters, we wouldn't be able to use Catilda for mana since it's a tap ability, but uh, yeah, it's still a nice mana sink to have access to, assuming you can make enough tokens and other humans to activate it in the first place. And it is an ability we can use at instant speed, so can still potentially use Catilda as a blocker for any potential werewolves and then activate it in the opponent's end of turn. So just a ton of flexibility and all for just two mana. So this card seems awesome and worthy of an A grade. Definitely a bomb level card for the green white humans deck. Next is a Kassig Naturalist's a red green two drop. It's an uncommon human werewolf. And whenever the naturalist attacks, we add a red or green to our mana pool. And until end of turn, we don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. And this is a daybound card, so much like our Arlen Planeswalker, we will play this. If it's not day or night, it will be day when the naturalist enters the battlefield. If it's already night, then instead of playing the naturalist, it will enter the battlefield as the backside, which is the Lord of the Olvenwald, in this case, a 3 3 werewolf, saying other wolves and werewolves we control get plus one plus one. And whenever the Lord attacks, we add red or green, and it also doesn't go away as steps and phases end until end of turn. So this is the Nightbound half of the card. So yeah, both halves of the card are great. Of course, the Wolf half even better, but you're pretty happy having the Naturalist around to help you ramp into your powerful 4 and 5 mana Werewolves, of which there are many. So Naturalist gets a B. Great card for the Red-Green Werewolf archetype. Then we have Lisa, Forgotten Archangel, 5 mana for a 4-5 Legendary Angel at rare in black-white, has Flying and Lifelink. So already 4-5 Flying and Lifelink for 5, very hard to deal with. So if you don't have a removal spell at the ready, this is almost impossible to race. And uh, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, return that card to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. So as if the 4-5 Flying Lifelink weren't enough, we still get a very powerful ability on top. And if a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. So no disturb shenanigans for the opponent. So yeah, Lisa seems incredibly strong and also has a bit of synergy with a black-white sacrifice deck where you might end up sacrificing your own creatures and getting them back. I think this can sneak up into the S tier just because of how powerful it is. With the caveat that, of course, if the opponent has a removal spell at the ready, you might not get any value from Lisa whatsoever, which is uncharacteristic for the S tier cards, which usually still provide some value even if the opponent has removal. But uh, if we take a look at the entirety of the set, there's not that many removal spells. Definitely a pretty removal light set in comparison to some others. So I think that means that Lisa is going to dominate a lot of games where you can cast her. Next is Ludovic Necrogenius, 2 mana, 2-3 two, legendary human wizard at rare in blue-black. And when Ludovic enters the battlefield or attacks, we mill a card. And then for X, double blue and double black, we exile X creature cards from our graveyard and transform a common play pattern. We play this on turn 2, maybe attack with it once or twice, mill a few cards, and then on turn 5 at the earliest, we can exile one creature card and transform. So let's see what happens once we transform. We get Olag Ludovic's Hubris, which is a 4-4 legendary zombie, but it doesn't stop there. As this creature transforms, it becomes a copy of a creature card exiled with it, except its name is Olag, and it's a 4-4, and it's a legendary blue and black zombie in addition to its other colors and types, and we get to put a number of plus one plus one counters on Olag equal to the number of creature cards exiled with it. So that's a mouthful, but uh, the simple version of it is if we exiled one creature, it's going to be a 5-5 with the properties of one of the creatures we exiled. If we exile two creatures, it's going to be a 6-6, etc. So 
the earliest we can transform is x equals 1, so it's going to be a 5-5 with potential additional abilities. So yeah, card seems good. Blue-black has a lot of ways to make use of the graveyard, so just a milling part on the front half can potentially give us a bit of value with flashback. And uh, you never know what sweet creatures you can turn into and potentially have some other activated abilities we can leverage. So overall this card seems quite strong and worthy of an A. Next is Old Stick Fingers, X, Black and a Green. For a legendary horror in Golgari colors. So this is a rare star star. This creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of creature cards in our graveyard. And when we cast Old Stick Fingers, we reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal X creature cards and put all those cards into our graveyard. And the other cards get uh, put on the bottom of our library in a random order. Assuming no other creatures in the graveyard beforehand, Let's say we cast this for x equals 3. It's going to be a 5 mana 3-3 three, three essentially. But the upside of course is if there's already some creatures in the graveyard, all stick fingers could get much bigger. And who knows, maybe you've got creatures with Disturb that you get to replay out of the graveyard somehow. Although most of those are in blue and white, so there's not that many uh, Disturb cards in black-green if I recall does potentially set up some graveyard synergies, like we saw earlier, cards that care about number of cards in graveyard. So it does have that uh, upside as well. Still not thrilled about Old Stick Fingers. I uh, don't think this is a bomb level card, but assuming you're in black-green and you care about your graveyard, this is probably around a C+. And next is Rem. Carolus, Stalwart, Slayer, 3 mana, 2 3, Legendary Human Knight in the Boros Colors. And it's a rare, it has flying and haste. So a bit reminiscent of the Sky Knight Legionnaire from Ravnica. It says if a spell would deal damage to you or another permanent you control, prevent that damage. And if a spell would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus one instead. So those additional abilities could be relevant if you've got some burn spells for sure. But for the most part we can just kind of evaluate this as a 3 mana 2 3 flying haste for 3, which is already quite strong. So yeah, card seems good. Um, I don't think this quite falls into the bomb category, but definitely a high B at the very least. Next is Right of Harmony, 2 mana instant. In green-white, at rare, says whenever a creature or enchantment enters a battlefield under your control, draw a card. And having to cast Rite of Harmony alongside another creature or token maker, even in the best case scenario, is not going to be trivial. And usually enchantments are on the expensive side. So yeah, I think best case scenario, it's like turn 5 or 6, you play Rite of Harmony and you maybe draw two, maximum three cards if you throw a, a token maker in the mix. Still seems pretty difficult to set up and those are kind of the best case circumstances. It does also have flashback but it's four mana so the odds of being able to draw a lot of cards with flashback are pretty slim. So not a huge fan of Rite of Harmony, seems rather difficult to get a lot of value out of it. So I'm gonna go with a D. Right of Oblivion, 2 mana sorcery at uncommon in black-white. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a non-land permanent. So this goes back to black-white caring about sacrifice synergies. And we can exile target a non-land permanent. So we do get a pretty efficiently costed removal effect, assuming we have expendable creature tokens maybe to sacrifice. So it plays well with the decayed zombies. And this also has flashback for 4 mana, so a pretty reasonable price. So given that the set doesn't have a ton of powerful removal spells, Right of Oblivion probably goes up in value a little bit. And given the presence of the decayed zombies, it shouldn't be too difficult to sacrifice something and not feel too bad about it. So yeah, Right of Oblivion gets a B, 
just an efficiently costed removal spell that we can potentially cast twice. Root Coil Creeper is the blue-green signpost uncommon. It's a 2-2 plant horror and can tap to add one mana of any color, or we can add two mana of any one color that we can spend only to cast spells from our graveyard. And as we'll see, blue-green cares a lot about flashback, it cares about disturb creatures in blue specifically. So getting to use that second ability is going to come up quite often in blue-green. And we can also pay blue-green tap and exile the creeper to return target card with flashback we own from exile to our hand. So that can also provide a ton of extra value in the late game. So blue-green cares about replaying things out of the graveyard, it cares about ramping, and blue-green also has access to the most mana fixing, as the creeper is a good example of that. So we can potentially splash some powerful bombs in other colors, which is not something every color is able to do as easily. So yeah, creeper seems good and gets a B. Just a powerful build around, can lead to some explosive starts and can provide value in the late game. So not much more you can ask out of your 2-drop. Sacred Fire is next, a 2-mana instant in red-white at Uncommon, dealing 2 damage to any target and you gain 2 life. So a mini version of Lightning Helix, still quite powerful. There's a ton of creatures that will die to Sacred Fire in the early game, and then it also has flashback for 6 mana, so we get to do it once again later on, and uh, potentially a card that could combo with the 2-3 uh, flyer that we saw earlier to deal one additional point of damage and turn it into an actual lightning helix. So yeah, there's a lot to like about Sacred Fire. I think the set does have decks that can be quite aggressive, like the Black Red Vampire deck that we'll see. So having that early removal is going to be pretty key. And uh, being an instant also has upside in a set that has werewolves where potentially timing your removal so you can flip certain cards to the night side is uh, also potentially important. So yeah, I think overall that uh, adds up to a B for Sacred Fire. Next is Sigarda, Champion of Light, 4 mana for a 4-4 Legendary Angel and Mythic. It has Flying and Trample and says humans you control get plus one plus one. So this is a pretty powerful a green-white card and comes with the green-white keyword of Coven. Whenever Sigarda attacks, if we control those three different creatures, we get to look at the top five cards of our library and reveal a human creature card from among them and put it into our hand. And the rest goes on the bottom. So just a very efficiently costed creature that pumps the team and can potentially provide card advantage. So yeah, Sigarda. I don't think quite gets to the S tier, but I don't think it matters too much. If you open a pack with Sigarda, pack one, pick one, you're probably taking it. And I can't think of many uncommons that uh, would be better. So yeah, Sigarda gets an A at the very least. Siphon Insights, a two mana instant at rare in blue-black. Get to look at the top two cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down and put the other on the bottom of that library. And then we can look at that card and play that exiled card for as long as it remains exiled and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. And we can flash it back for three mana. So potentially a nice two for one, even if it does take a while to cast all those spells reminiscent of think twice just add an extra color and instead of drawing a card you're drawing a card from the opponent's library so you know it's kind of slow but uh, in a deck that maybe has a few counter spells and that wants access to some instant speed card draw to use its mana is uh, potentially still okay and uh, flashback means if we randomly mill siphon insight we still get the back half of it essentially so yeah, seems like an okay card and uh, probably falls somewhere in the C plus category. Next is Slogurk, the Overslime. Three mana for a 3-3 three, three legendary ooze at rare. It tramples and says whenever a land card is put into your graveyard from anywhere, put a plus one plus one counter on it. 
and we can remove three counters from it to return it to its owner's hand. And when this creature leaves the battlefield, we can return up to three target land cards from our graveyard to our hand. Bit of a strange card, blue-green does have a few ways of potentially milling itself and therefore putting those lands into the graveyard to grow it. Even if we just evaluate it as a 3-3 Trampler for 3 with very slight upside, it's still okay. So it probably falls somewhere in the C-plus category. And uh, if you have a deck with a lot of self-mill, it will go up in value accordingly. Next is Storm Skrelix. 5 mana, 2-4, Drake Horror in the blue-red colors at Uncommon. It has Flying and says instant and sorcery spells you cast cause one generic mana less to cast and whenever we cast an instant or sorcery the Skrelix gets plus two plus oh until end of turn. So a little bit slow to get going at five mana but once we get the Skrelix down the mana discount on instants and sorceries again I'm kind of picturing this blue red spells matters deck that has Maybe just a handful of creatures like the Skrelix and all the rest of it is instants and sorceries. Then I can imagine the Skrelix being very threatening, potentially being able to deal 6 or 8 damage in one turn. So in that deck I like the Skrelix. In a deck that only has like 5 or 6 instants and sorceries, the Skrelix seems pretty bad. So kind of have to rate it accordingly. So at the end of the day... I think the Skrelix also falls in the C plus category where it's a card I'm probably going to be pretty happy with in the dedicated blue-red spells decks. But um, again, the instant and sorcery count is very important for it. Then we have Sunrise Cavalier, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three Human Knight at Uncommon in red-white colors. It has Trample and Haste, so already there. We're pretty happy with the uh, three mana, three three trample haste. And then it says if it's neither day or night, it becomes day as the cavalier enters the battlefield. So we'll notice in red white there's a small theme that cares about creatures entering the battlefield and switching the day night cycle back to day. So if it's not day or night at all, the cavalier will turn it into day and then the day and night cycle will essentially begin. So that's potentially one way that it can turn into night even without a werewolf ever being on the battlefield and then subsequent werewolves will enter the battlefield with their backside. So just a lot to keep track of once a creature like this enters a battlefield. And then of course there's even more. Whenever day becomes night or night becomes day we can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control. So the cavalier doesn't transform itself, it just cares about keeping track of day and night. So that's kind of specific for some of these Boros cards, unlike some of the red-green werewolves that actually transform if it turns to night. So yeah, the Sunrise Cavalier, just uh, a lot going for it, decent stats and can accumulate more value over time. So this gets a B, powerful card. Next is Teferi, who slows the sunset for mana Planeswalker at 4 mana in blue-white, of course. And the plus one says choose up to one target artifact, up to one target creature, and up to one target land. Get to untap the chosen permanents we control, and tap the chosen permanents we don't control, and gain two life. So can use it as a way to keep up our instance, give our creatures vigilance or pseudo-vigilance, or we can use it to uh, tamp down opposing creatures. The ability we care most about is probably the minus two, which lets us take a look at top three cards of our library, put one of them into our hands and the rest on the bottom of our library. So that's actual card advantage, whereas the plus one is just kind of uh, fiddling with some permanence in play. So yeah, the fairy doesn't seem busted, seems okay. As most planeswalkers in limited, it's tends to overperform since players, especially less experienced players, will often throw away a ton of resources just to get rid of your planeswalker, even if it's in this case not that amazing. But uh, yeah, if you can play Teferi and get a couple activations out of it, it will definitely provide a lot of card advantage, even if the plus one isn't amazing.
And then a minus seven, probably not gonna come up a whole lot, but just in case we get an emblem saying, untap all permanents you control during each opponent's untap step, and you draw a card during each opponent's draw step. So if you've got a ton of instant speed spells, that minus seven's gonna be pretty sweet, but uh, not gonna come up in limited very often. So overall, Teferi gets a B, not a busted Planeswalker, but still quite good. Next is Tovalar, Dire Overlord, a 3-mana, three 3-3 three, three legendary human werewolf in red-green at rare. And whenever a wolf or werewolf we control deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. So if we deal damage with multiple of those wolves or werewolves, we get to draw multiple cards, which is different from Grasselax from uh, Forgotten Realms, for instance. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control three or more wolves and or werewolves, it becomes knight. And then transform any number of human werewolves we control. And this is the daybound side. So Tovalar also transforms at night into the midnight scourge. So if it's already night, when we play Tovalar, it will enter the battlefield as the werewolf side, which is a 4-4. And says also that we get to draw a card if one of our wolves or werewolves deal combat damage to a player and we can pay X, a red and a green and then target a wolf or werewolf we control gets plus X plus O and gains trample until end of turn. So just a ton of powerful abilities all for just three mana. Uh, probably not quite an S tier but about as powerful as an A will get. So this card seems awesome for the werewolf deck and might even see some constructed play. Then we have a natural Moonrise, a two mana sorcery at Uncommon. Says it becomes Knight, and until end of turn, target creature gets plus one plus zero and gains trample. And whenever this creature deals comma damage to a player, draw a card. A bit of a strange one. Will play pretty well in a red green werewolf deck where you actively want to switch it to night time. And this also has flashback for four mana. So in a deck with a lot of big werewolves that don't inherently have trample. I could see Moonrise being a playable card. Outside of it, it's probably not that amazing. So it's uh, probably closer to a C grade level card where it's a card that the red green decks should be able to get pretty late in draft and uh, the other ones aren't probably too interested. Then we have Vandrick, Astral Archmage, a three mana one, two legendary human wizard at rare and says if it's neither day or night, it becomes day as Vandrick enters the battlefield, and instant and sorcery spells we cast cost X less to cast, where X is Vandrick's power. And whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, we can put a plus one plus one counter on Vandrick. So another decent enabler for the blue-red spells deck, assuming we have lots of instants and sorceries, and similar to some of those red-white cards that we saw earlier, can... Uh, turn it to day despite not transforming into werewolf himself. So yeah, in the blue-red spells deck I like Vandrick, but again it's pretty important that we have enough ways to make use of that discount. End of the day probably gets a C as uh, another card that you should be able to get relatively late in the blue-red deck. Then we have a Vampire Socialite, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two Vampire Noble at Uncommon has Menace. And when the Socialite enters a battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, we can put a plus one plus one counter on each author vampire we control. And as long as an opponent lost life this turn, each author vampire we control enters a battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. So we can play it early and get plus one counters, or we can play it late and pump the team. So yeah, the Socialite seems pretty good. Uh, two, two, minus for two with a ton of upside. Red-black is a color pair that wants to be aggressive, it cares about consistently dealing damage to the opponent, so Menace definitely helps with that. So the Socialite seems like a key card for an aggressive vampire deck and gets a B. Next is Wake to Slaughter, a 5 mana rare sorcery. Let's just choose up to two target creature cards in our graveyard, and an opponent chooses one of them. We return that card to our hand and then return the author to the battlefield under our control, gains haste, 
and we have to exile it at the beginning of the next end step. And we can flash back Wake to Slaughter for 6 mana total. So the problem here with Wake to Slaughter is that we're giving the opponent a choice. If we have two creatures, one of which is maybe bigger than the other, the opponents might just uh, take the hit from the bigger creature and then give us the weaker creature to actually keep around. So it's a bit of an awkward reanimation spell. Let's say the opponent has blocks available for one of your two creatures. It's essentially just a bad reanimation spell that puts a card back in your hand. So I'm not a huge fan of Wake to Slaughter. I think this is closer to a D than anything else. Although maybe in a deck with good ETB effects, it uh, moves up in value a little bit. Winterthorn Blessing is a blue-green sorcery at Uncommon. For two mana, we get to put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature we control, and then tap up to one target creature we don't control, and that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. And can also flash it back for three mana. So this is a, a bit of a strange one. Doesn't immediately scream blue-green that really cares about the whole multicolor kind of ramp theme, but... Uh, this could easily let you turn the corner in a game and let you become the beatdown deck. Maybe if you've got some large green creatures, then it's going to be pretty hard for the opponent to beat you in a racing situation. So uh, I don't think every blue-green deck necessarily is going to want the Winter Thorn Blessing, but in a deck that's maybe more green than blue, that can be quite aggressive, curve out, I could see Blessing doing a ton of work as kind of your last spell to close out the game and win a race. So just don't think it's going to fit into every blue-green deck. So I'm going to give it a C overall, but uh, definitely one to watch out for. So to sum up all the multicolor color pairs and all the archetypes in Limited, we've got blue-white, disturb slash spirits, so they care about filling the graveyard and casting disturbed creatures out of the graveyard, which will often be spirits. So there will be a bit of spirit tribal synergy, as we'll see later. Then red-white has a few creatures that will turn it to daytime when they enter the battlefield, and will provide advantage over time as it switches from day to night and from night to day. But overall, red-white is not one of the more well-defined color pairs, I would say. I think red-white is just going to be fine playing aggressive creatures and combat tricks and removal and you don't necessarily need to lean too heavily into the whole uh, day and night theme. Then blue black has a lot of decades and zombie synergies and we'll see a ton of cards that can make those zombie tokens in both blue and black. Then black green also not the most well-defined color pair but has a few cards that care about filling the graveyard. Of course, it will have flashback cards that it can get back from the graveyard, so any self-mill cards are welcome. Then red-green is all about werewolves, so this is a color pair that has the highest density of wolf and werewolf creatures, and that's where switching to nighttime is going to be most beneficial. So anything you can play at instant speed, so you can pass a turn and let it turn to nighttime, are also going to go up in value. Blue-red cares about instants and sorceries, a ton of cards we've seen so far that care about having tons of instants and sorceries, and we'll see even more in both blue and red. Then black-white has a small sacrifice theme, so any decayed zombies that we come across are also going to be quite strong in black-white as good sacrifice fodder. Then black red is also one of the more well-defined color pairs alongside red, green and blue-white, I believe, as a very aggressive color pair that has a few vampire synergies. So that's the color pair that you want to watch out for if they can curve out, can be incredibly dangerous. Then green-white has some human synergies, some token synergies, has the most cards with the coven ability. So wants to be able to go wide and have a nice mix of power and toughness. And finally, blue-green, also not the most well-defined color pair, has a lot of cards with flashback in both blue and green, has the whole multicolor theme that potentially allows you to splash additional colors, so kind of a dirtly color combination that can go in a lot of different directions, 
and potentially even more of a beatdown deck as we saw earlier with the two mana flashback card. So this is a quick overview of all the color pairs in Limited. Our first white card is Adelin Resplendent Cathar, three mana star four, whose power is equal to the number of creatures we control. It's a legendary human knight at rare and has vigilance. And whenever we attack, for each opponent we get to make a 1-1 white human creature token that's tapped and attacking that player or planeswalker they control. So in uh, 1v1 we're just going to get a single human creature token. But Adlin seems great. It's a card that doesn't even have to attack itself to generate that 1-1 human token. So we could be attacking with something else and still get it. The fact that... Uh, Adeline's power goes up when we attack with her and generate the token is also quite powerful. And then four toughness plus vigilance plays offense and defense nicely. So there are just a, a lot to like about this card and all the stats are great. It's a, a great way to enable Coven as well, as we'll have lots of creatures with different power stats. So... I think Adeline gets an A. A bomb level card for sure. Next is Ambitious Farmhand, a 2 mana 1 1 human peasant and uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, we may search our library for a basic planes card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. So already the farmhand's a nice 2 for 1. And then has Coven for 3 mana. We can transform the Ambitious Farmhand, but can only be activated if we have three or more creatures with different powers. So unlike some of the other coven creatures we saw earlier that will potentially uh, trigger and the opponent can still kill one of our creatures to deny the coven ability, once we activate the coven ability on the farmhand, it doesn't matter if the opponent messes with our power and toughness or kills one of our creatures, it will transform. And in this case, we get Seasoned Cathar, a 3-3 human knight with a lifelink. So yeah, I like this card a lot. Already a two for one on the front side, and then the back half, if we can get to it eventually, just an efficiently costed creature. So giving the farmhand a B. So again, I don't want to be confusing you with these transform cards. There are both transform cards that don't care about day and night whatsoever, this being an example, and then separately there's the whole wolf and werewolf cycle of cards that transform based on whether it's day or night, but uh, this is just a separate type of transform card. And then of course the disturb cards are another type of transform card that doesn't care about the day or night cycle. And Beloved Beggar is next, a 2 mana 4 at Uncommon, Human Peasant, and it's just gonna sit there until at some point it dies and we can replay it out of the graveyard for its disturb cost. And it's uh, six mana. And it's gonna be a generous soul that we cast out of the graveyard, a 4-4 four, four spirit with flying and vigilance. And if it dies like all spirits with disturb, it gets exiled. So an early blocker, a creature that has zero power could also be relevant for Coven. Even though it has zero power, it still counts as a creature having a different point of power than maybe two other creatures to give you the Coven ability. So that's potentially relevant. And then a 4-4 flyer in the late game can be very powerful too. So yeah, a lot to like about the beggar, even if the opponent can somehow or somewhat play around it by not attacking into the 0-4 with a creature that's large enough to kill it if they really want to keep you from making the 4-4 flyer. So there will be circumstances where you're stuck with 0-4 for a while, but overall still gets a C plus at the very least. Next is a Bereaved Survivor, 3 mana for a 2-1 Human Peasant at Uncommon. Says whenever another creature you control dies, we get to transform the Survivor, and it transforms into Dauntless Avenger. So once again a transform card that has nothing to do with the day or night cycle. And the Avenger is a 3-2 that, when it attacks, gets a return target creature card with mana value 2 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, tapped and attacking. 
Of course, there will be circumstances where the opponent can easily block that 2-drop right away, but it's just pure upside. So, yeah, Avenger seems pretty strong. Um, if we can transform it, of course, need to go through the phase of controlling the survivor and having a creature die, but especially in black-white that has the small sacrifice theme, that shouldn't be too difficult. So, yeah, I like the survivor overall and gets a C+. Plus. Blessed Defiance is a one-mana instant at common, so it's going to be one of the many combat tricks in the set. It says target creature you control gets plus two plus so and gains a lifelink until end of turn, and when that creature dies it turns into a 1-1 one, one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So as far as combat tricks go, this isn't great at protecting your creature. It's more of a way for a small creature to trade up with a larger creature, gain you some life, and turns into a 1-1 flyer, which for one mana is a pretty decent deal, since you would sometimes be interested in just having a 1-1 flyer for one mana in a, a number of decks. So uh, yeah, Blast Defiance seems like a, a decent combo trick. Gets better if you've got any first strike or double strike creatures, as those will pair well with any pump spells, especially that also give lifelink. Seems like a decent trick, but probably not one that's going to be in high demand, so you should be able to get it pretty late. So we'll give it a C. Then we have a Borrowed Time, three mana enchantment at Uncommon, and it's basically a banishing light as it enters the battlefield, exiles target a non land permanent and opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. So a solid removal spell in a set that doesn't have a ton of quality removal. This is by far the best removal spell we get in white. So Borrow Time gets a B. Brutal Cathar is next, a 3 mana 2-2 two, two, human soldier werewolf at rare. And when this creature enters a battlefield or transforms into Brutal Cathar, we get to exile target creature and opponent controls until this creature leaves the battlefield. And this is the daybound side, so if it's neither day or night and we play Cathar, it's going to be day, and the day and night cycle will begin. And of course, as always, if the active player doesn't cast any spells on the following upkeep, it will transform to night, and if it's night and the active player casts two spells or more in the same turn on the next upkeep, it will transform back to day. If it's already nighttime when we play Brutal Cathar, it won't enter the battlefield as Brutal Cathar, but instead it will enter the battlefield as a Moonrage Brute, which is a 3 3 werewolf with first strike and ward, which makes the opponent pay 3 life if they want to target the brute with a spell or ability. So this is a nightbound side. So this is a card that you would probably prefer to play on the daybound side first, since you typically want a removal effect, and then you're pretty happy to transform it back and forth a few times to potentially exile multiple creatures, because uh, that's something the Cathar is capable of if it doesn't get removed, and it transforms back and forth a few times. It is uh, capable of exiling multiple creatures, and uh, yeah, overall this card seems great, especially if the opponent can deal with it easily, so gets an A from me. Next is a Candle Grove Witch, a 2 mana 2 2 at common with Coven, which will give it flying until end of turn. So, just a nice cheap creature. And the way I like to evaluate my 2 drops is 2 drops, you know, are typically quite important in limiteds. If the opponent plays a 2 drop and you don't, you're already going to start to fall behind pretty quickly. And the problem with playing too many 2-drops is that they can get blanked pretty easily. If I've got a deck full of 2-2s and the opponent plays a 3-3, then my 2-2 looks pretty bad in comparison. But if my 2-2 at some point has additional abilities so that it can still turn into a relevant creature again, then they go up in value dramatically, and gaining flying is about as good as it gets for a 2-drop. So yeah, I like the Candle Grove Witch, and I'll give it a C+ assuming your deck has enough ways to enable Coven. Candle Trap, 1 mana enchantment aura at common, enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature has Defender, so it won't be able to attack. 
and prevent all combat damage that would be dealt by the enchanted creature. So the only thing that Candle Tramp doesn't deal with is, let's say the opponent has a large creature, maybe like a 5-5, five five, and we use Candle Tramp, we will be able to attack into it, it won't deal any damage, so we don't lose any of our creatures by attacking into it, but it can still soak up a lot of damage. Let's say we're attacking with our four-powered creature, then their 5-5 five five is still preventing four damage every turn. So that's the, the major downside of Candle Tramp. Plus it also doesn't immediately deal with utility creatures that might have a good uh, activated ability or triggered ability. That still happens. So Candle Tramp does have its limitations, but if we also have Coven, we can pay three additional mana, sacrifice Candle Tramp, and again, once we activate this, it doesn't matter if the opponent messes with our Coven, it's still going to resolve, and then we get to exile the enchanted creature. So, yeah, Candle Tramp, not an amazing removal spell, but given that this is one of the few options we have available, it will probably make your deck more often than not in white. I'm still not thrilled about it, but it probably gets at least a C. Next is Cathar Commando, a 2-mana 3-1 human soldier at common. It has flash, and anything that can be played at instant speed will also go up in value in this set, just because of the presence of all the werewolves. So if you have any werewolves in the deck yourself, this is an easy way to transform them to the night side, since you can just pass a turn if it's daytime, and transform it to night, and then still play the commando in the opponent's turn, to spend your mana in a useful manner, but white not really known for having a ton of werewolves, so of course if you're up against an opposing werewolf deck that uh, can potentially be a downside, so that's going to force you to sometimes play the commando at sorcery speed, but we still get a 3-1 that for one mana can be sacrificed to destroy target artifact or enchantment, so a nice naturalize effect. Although there's not too many artifacts or enchantments in the set as a whole that are worth uh, destroying, but still, you know, pure upside on a 2 mana 3-1. Three, 3 power, also useful for enabling Coven if you've got some other lower powered creatures. So overall gets probably somewhere around a C, C+, depending on how important the disenchant ability ends up being. Cathar's Call is a 3-mana aura and uncommon, enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature has Vigilance, and at the beginning of your end step create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. I'm not a fan of this, even though it is a way to create an army for the green-white go-white deck. It doesn't have an immediate impact when you play it, sure you get Vigilance, but that's one of the least impactful abilities on an enchantment like this that doesn't add power or toughness. So I think this is just a D, sets you up to getting 2 for ones too easily, and the upside isn't really there. Celestus Sanctifier is a 3-mana three 3-2 three at common. Human Cleric says if it's neither day or night, becomes day as the Sanctifier enters the battlefield, and whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, get to look at the top two cards of our library and put one of them into our graveyard. In this case, the deck that's probably most interested in the Sanctifier that plays white is the blue-white Disturb deck, as the ability allows you to put some of your Disturb creatures in the graveyard. Red-white, of course, could still have some white Disturb creatures or some other flashback cards, but I imagine blue-white is where this will be at its best. So overall, not an exciting creature, 3-mana three 3-2 three, with marginal upside, still uh, probably just a C. Next is Chaplain of Alms, a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one human cleric at Uncommon, and it has First Strike and Ward 1, and it also has Disturb for 4-mana, so a lot of different abilities, and let's take a look at the back half, which is Chapel Shieldgeist, a 2-1 with Flying and First Strike, saying each creature you control has Ward 1. So there's just a lot going on with this card, I think this is going to be at its best in like the black-white sacrifice deck, where the chaplain is just a cheap creature we can play early, maybe get in a few points, 
If the opponent has one toughness creatures, the first strike will hold off those creatures for a while, and then eventually we can also sacrifice it to our many sacrifice abilities, and later still get the flyer, which is also not too bad, flying first strike. So yeah, I think those are a lot of useful abilities altogether that make this at the very least a C plus, if not better. Clarion Cathars is 4 mana for a 3-3, three, three, that when it enters a battlefield creates a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. So a decent creature, considering this is a set that cares about humans that go white, having different power and toughness. So this is two-thirds of a coven just by itself, which isn't too bad. Um, the stats are okay for 4 mana, nothing exceptional. This is probably closer to a C than a C+, but in the dedicated green-white coven decks you're going to be quite happy with a few of these. Curse of Silence is an F, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's probably more of a card meant for Constructed, and even there it's questionable. Dualcraft Trainer, 4 mana for a 3-3 human soldier and uncommon with first strike. And Coven says at the beginning of combat, we get to give target creature we control double strike until end of turn. So 3-3 three, three first strike for 4, not bad, especially if we have other ways of increasing its power somehow with plus 1 counters or there's a couple equipment, although not that many. But if we do get that double strike ability, we're definitely in business getting to give a creature double strike each turn. And then we don't even have to be attacking with the dual craft trainer, we can still keep the 3-3 three, three first strike on defense. So yeah, overall, definitely at least a C+, but uh, I could see this card overperforming depending on how easy it is to get Coven early in the game. Next is Enduring Angel, 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three Angel at Mythic has flying, double strike, and says you have hexproof, so we can be the target of spells or abilities, like discard effects or burn spells. And if our life total would be reduced to zero or less, instead we get to transform Enduring Angel and our life total becomes three. And uh, then if for some reason the Enduring Angel didn't transform this way, we lose the game. So that can potentially come up if you try to copy the Enduring Angel, because copies don't keep track of the backside of the card, so that's uh, probably an interaction you want to avoid with your croaking counterpart or what have you. But let's say the Enduring Angel does transform, then we get the Angelic Enforcer, Star Star, with flying, still says we have hexproof, and Angelic Enforcer's power and toughness are each equal to our life total. So. If the Angel transforms, our life total becomes 3, and uh, this will be a 3-3, three, three, but when the Enforcer attacks we get to double our life total. So from 3 life we go to 6 life, which will happen before damage, so this will get in for 6 damage, and it's only gonna get bigger from there. The creature itself doesn't have Hexproof, so it can be answered by most removal spells, but uh, can be incredibly annoying for the opponent to deal with if they don't have a removal spell at the ready. So gets at the very least an A, bomb level card for sure. Fateful Absence. This is potentially a controversial card, a 2 mana instant at rare, destroys target creature or planeswalker and its controller investigates. Now this card might be great for constructed, but this is our evaluation for limited where giving the opponent a clue token that draws them a card is a pretty big drawback. Now if you're a very aggressive deck, which could be the case, maybe you've got like a very aggressive coven deck that doesn't give the opponent time to sacrifice a clue token, then this will be great. But in most limited games the opponent will have time to sack that clue and draw a card, and uh, at that point I would much rather pay one or two extra mana to deny them the card, as opposed to getting the cheaper Fateful Absence. So I think the card's playable, I don't think it's amazing, I'm, I'm not excited to first pick this, I think it falls somewhere in the C, maybe C plus even, but I'll go with the conservative C for Fateful Absence. 
Flare of Faith is 2 mana for an instant, at common, saying target creature gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. If it's a human, instead it gets plus 3 plus 3 and indestructible until end of turn. So a fine combat trick. Um, in the coven decks where you're going to have the highest density of humans, it's going to be a little bit better. Although I think that deck has enough other pump spells and things that care about coven that I don't know if you're going to have room for a lot of copies of a flare of faith but you can imagine this being pretty strong in combination with the double strike creature from earlier so yeah fine combat trick probably lands somewhere around c gavany dawnguard is a three mana three three human soldier and uncommon with a ward one and says if it's neither day or night becomes day as it enters and when it transforms back and forth we get to reveal a creature card with mana value 3 or less from the top 4 cards of our library and put it into our hand. So this can provide a steady stream of card advantage if we can keep flipping it back and forth between day and night. And already by itself a 3 mana 3-3 three, three with ward 1 seems pretty strong, so this card has a lot going for it. And especially in white, it shouldn't be too difficult to flip from night back to day, just because casting two spells uh, should be pretty trivial given how many cheap spells you can have in a white deck. There's cheap cards with flashback, plus the dawn guard helps you find more cards to cast two spells in the same turn, so you'll be able to transform back and forth between day and night to accumulate more card advantage. So yeah, overall, B for the dawn guard seems like a fun build around. Gavany Silversmith is a 4 mana 2 3 human soldier at common, and when it enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each of up to 2 target creatures. I had a bit of a, a double take when I first read this card, so it's very much reminiscent of the 2 3 lifelink from M21 that uh, distributed 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. The major difference here is that you're allowed to put the plus 1 counter on the Silversmith itself which is a pretty big departure from the previous card I mentioned. So if we have another creature, this could be a 3-4 that puts a plus one counter on that creature, but we also have the flexibility of spreading out those counters even more. So it gets at the very least a C+, plus, but uh, this is definitely one of those cards that probably plays a lot better than it looks, and it already looks good. So yeah, I like it a lot. Gavany Trapper, 1 mana, 0 2, human soldier, at common, and for 2 mana we can tap it to tap target creature. So tappers are historically quite strong in limited, and uh, yeah, no difference here. Zero power, again, could still be useful for Coven. The fact that we get to play it on turn 1 allows us to enable Coven pretty early on in the game. Yeah, Gavany Trapper seems great and gets a C+. Plus. Something else worth mentioning about the Silversmith is also that it's a great way to enable Coven by distributing those plus one counters. Gives you a ton of agency over different powers and toughness. So yeah, another reason to like the Silversmith, but the Trapper also gets a C plus. Hatchwitch's Mask, on the other hand, I'm not too thrilled about a one mana equipment at common, giving the equipped creature plus one plus one and the equipped creature cannot be blocked by creatures with power 4 or greater, equips for 2 mana. So just not a very impactful card, only giving plus 1 plus 1, even if it is relatively cheap to play and equip, still not sold on it, so I'm gonna give this one a D. Homestead Courage, on the other hand, despite having a few similarities with our previous card, I like a little bit more as a 1 mana sorcery, at common, that puts a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control. It also gains vigilance until end of turn and has flashback for one white mana. So we can potentially cast it twice in the same turn, which is great for switching nighttime back to daytime, which is pretty difficult to do with one card and two mana. So it's pretty unique in that sense. And uh, in a white aggressive deck, this can make blocks pretty difficult for the opponent. Vigilance means you get to play offense and defense, makes it pretty difficult to race, 
and flashback means that if we randomly put this in our graveyard some other way we still get a bit of value and uh, another great way of course to set up your coven in the decks that care about it so i think that adds up to enough where this might be one of those overperformers that may not seem all that impressive at first glance but plays out a lot better in practice so i'm gonna give this a speculative c plus Intrepid Adversary doesn't need any speculation, this card's awesome. 2 mana, 3 1 at Mythic, Human Scout has lifelink, and when the adversary enters the battlefield, you may pay 1 and a white any number of times. So think of it as multi kicker, and when we pay this cost, we get to put that many Valor counters on Intrepid Adversary. And creatures we control get plus one plus one for each Valor counter on Intrepid Adversary. So for two mana, we just get a 3-1 lifelink, but we have the flexibility of playing it as a 3-1 lifelink, which is the worst case scenario, which is still not too bad. If we play this for four mana, we get a 3-1 that gives our team a permanent plus one plus one bonus, so a nice glorious anthem on a creature. And... It says creatures we control, not author creatures we control, so it turns into a 4-2 lifelink itself. If we ever get to 6 mana, we're giving the team a permanent plus 2 plus 2 bonus. So if the opponent doesn't immediately remove this, it's going to be impossible for them to beat any of our creatures in combat. So yeah, this card scales incredibly well and just has a ton of flexibility at any point in the curve. It's going to be awesome. So yeah, this is an S. Next is Loyal Griff, 3 mana 2 2 flyer at uncommon. Also has Flash, and as we mentioned, Flash, pretty useful in a set with the werewolf mechanic. And when it enters the battlefield, we may return another creature we control to its owner's hand. So it can maybe save a creature that's about to be killed by removal, or we can pick up a creature that's underneath an opposing enchantment, like the uh, candle trap we saw earlier. I think this is still closer to a C than a C+. 2-2 two, two flyers for 3 mana used to be very good, but creatures have gotten better over time to the point where I'm not super excited about a 3 mana 2-2 two, two flyer unless it has a lot of other upside. And this card does have upside, but not typically if we're casting it on curve. If we're playing this on turn 3, the extra abilities are unlikely to be very relevant but it does give it a bit more utility in the late game, where we can maybe save a creature in a one-turn window. So, yeah, I think it's still probably closer to a C than a C+, but it's a cool card nonetheless. Next is Luminous Phantom, which is the backside of Lunark Veteran, a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one human cleric at common, and whenever another creature enters the battlefield under our control, we gain one life. And this card has Disturb, so we can cast it out of the graveyard, in which case it enters the battlefield as Luminous Phantom, a 1-1 flyer, saying whenever another creature we control leaves the battlefield, we gain one life, and then gets exiled if it dies. So a neat little creature that will play well in any Sacrifice deck, so like the Black-White Sacrifice deck, will want the veteran quite a bit as it provides multiple bodies for you to sacrifice. Not incredibly impactful, not particularly powerful on either side, and there's not really a life gain synergy deck where all the life gain triggers are relevant, so that's not really part of it. But uh, yeah, still a playable card, so I'll happily give this a C, and the black-white sacrifice decks are going to want to pick those up. And next is a Morning Patrol, 3 mana for a 2-3 human soldier at common, with Vigilance, and also has Disturb for 4 mana, so out of the graveyard it can be cast into Morning Apparition, which is a 2-1 flyer with Vigilance. So, thing to note about a 2-3 in the set is that it lines up well against the 2-2 Decayed Zombie tokens, so... 2-3 lines up pretty well in that sense, and uh, yeah, the Disturb is pure upsides on a creature that's already okay. So overall, I think this bumps it up to a C+, 
just because of all the utility it has with Disturb and uh, just the way it lines up in the format overall. Not an exciting creature by any means, but uh, I think both halves add up to enough where I'm probably never going to cut this from my white decks. Odrix Outrider is a 4 mana 2 4 at Uncommon. Human Knights says whenever the Outrider or another creature we control dies, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a target creature we control. So this will shine again in the Black White Sacrifice decks where we're actively killing our own creatures. Uh, plays well with the zombie tokens. So in that case, we can quickly pick up a lot of plus one plus one counters, maybe start putting those on our evasive creatures. And four mana, two four, not impressive stats, but you don't feel like you're too far behind if you play this on curve. So I think, again, this adds up to enough where I'm happy giving this a C plus. And in the very synergistic sacrifice decks, this will be even better. Ritual Guardian is a 3 mana 3 2 human soldier at common with Coven, which says if we have those three creatures, the Guardian gains lifelink until end of turn. So, yeah, nothing special. 3 2 that potentially gains lifelink, just a random filler creature gets a C. Ritual of Hope is a 2 mana instant at uncommon, giving creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. And if we have Coven, then our creatures get plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn instead. Plus 2 plus 1 for 2 mana is quite powerful if we've got a board full of tokens. But outside of the more dedicated token decks, it's not really a combat trick we're interested in. So I think that means this is probably just a C, a card you should be able to pick up as the dedicated green-white tokens player. Search Party Captain, 4 mana for a 2-2 Human Soldier at common, costs 1 less to cast for each creature we attacked with this turn, and when it enters the battlefield we draw a card. So 4 mana for a 2-2 that draws a card, a little bit overcosted, but you still don't feel embarrassed to play it for that cost. But as soon as we start getting a discount, this card gets very exciting, with the potential upside of Casting it for 1 mana as a 2-2 that draws a card. Not going to come up very often, but it is still a potential outcome. So yeah, C plus for Search Party Captain. A card that's pretty fun, especially good in the Sacrifice decks as well. Next is Sigardos Splendor, a 4 mana enchantment at rare that has a lot of text that's not super straightforward to grasp. So as it enters the battlefield, we note our life total. So we scribble it down somewhere. At the beginning of our upkeep, we draw a card if our life total is greater than or equal to the last noted life total for Zigarda Splendor. And then we note our life total again, replacing the previous note. So if it stopped there, I wouldn't be very excited about this as a card that conditionally draws cards. We spent 4 mana not impacting the board, so we make it easier for the opponent to hit us in the face and lower our life total, in which case we're not drawing any cards whatsoever. So this last line of text better redeem it, but uh, it doesn't really. Whenever we cast a white spell, we gain one whole life point. Yeah, I don't think that uh, makes up for playing a 4 mana enchantment that doesn't impact the board right away in a set that has a lot of high-powered werewolves that will quickly lower your life total to a point where this isn't drawing a lot of cards. Not a fan of Sigarda Splendor. If your opponent is not doing anything and not playing any creatures, then sure. But in most limited decks or matchups, this is probably a D. Sigardian Savior, 5 mana for a 3-3 Angel at Mythic. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, if we cast it, Return up to two target creature cards with mana value two or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. So, yeah, there's a lot to like about the Sigardian Savior. Now, not every deck is gonna have two cheap creatures readily available to reanimate. But again, thinking of maybe a sacrifice deck where we can uh, make that happen more easily, the Savior seems at its best. And even if we're just reanimating a single creature, it's still probably fine. 
Don't think this quite gets to bomb category, but at the very least a high B. Soul Guide Griff, 5 mana for a 3-4. Hippogriff Spirit with flying at common. And when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. Pretty relevant ability in a set full of flashback and disturb. So it's definitely a relevant upside. Not incredibly efficient, 3-4 flyer for 5, but also not embarrassing. I think this is probably just a C level card. And there are also a few ways to punish spirits in the set, so that's also worth keeping in mind. Sun Gold Barrage, 3 mana for an instant at common, which destroys a target creature with toughness for or greater. So another way to potentially punish our griff that we just covered. But uh, yeah, the set does have lots of large werewolves, and uh, some of them have a lot of toughness on both sides, both the human and the wolf side. So being able to kill the creature no matter which side they're on is relevant, because typically the werewolf side has a lot more power. So probably a removal spell that you're happy to have at least one copy of in the main deck. I would probably advise against having more than one in the main deck, since... Every now and then you're going to play against a uh, Go White token deck or some other aggro deck that doesn't get to for toughness very often, and this will be a bit too narrow. But in general, you should be able to find at least one target over the course of a game. So it gets a C. Kind of similar to Smite the Monstrous in previous sets. Sungold Sentinel, 2 mana for a 3 2 human soldier at rare when it enters the battlefield or attacks. Exile up to one target card from a graveyard. Again, all these free stapled on uh, graveyard hate effects are actually quite relevant in this set where a lot of your late game value is coming out of the graveyard. So not to be underestimated. And then Coven for one and a white lets us choose a color and the Sentinel gains hexproof from that color until end of turn and cannot be blocked by creatures of the chosen color this turn. And of course has the coven restriction. So the sentinel has a lot going for it. If we play this on turn 2, it's a 3-2 that can start beating down. But especially in the late game, once we get to maybe a board stall and so we can easily enable coven, then uh, this is not only a way for us to keep exiling cards from the opponent's graveyard, but it's also potentially just an unblockable threat, even if the opponent's playing a two-color deck where they have both uh, colors of creatures to potentially block with. We can activate the Coven ability twice per turn, there's no restriction on that. So we can just give protection and hexproof from both colors and get in for three repeatedly while cleaning out the opponent's graveyard. So yeah, a card that requires removal and if your opponent's or if you're the controller of Sentinel you can just always make sure to keep up two mana for hexproof, making that plan pretty difficult for the opponent as well. So, especially in the late game, once you have a lot of mana available, the Sentinel will truly shine. And uh, I think this is probably an A, a card that may not seem like a very impressive card, but I think in practice is gonna really show how powerful it can be. Sunset Revelry, 2 mana sorcery at uncommon, says if an opponent has more life than you, you gain 4 life. If an opponent controls more creatures than you, create two 1-1 one, one white human creature tokens. If an opponent has more cards in hand than you, draw a card. It's a bit reminiscent of timely reinforcements, kind of a smaller version. Now the problem I have with Revelry is we're very rarely gonna draw a card if we're using the other modes. Let's say we're up against an aggressive deck, the aggressive deck is pressuring our life total, they're ahead on board then yes, maybe we can gain four and make two one ones, which is not too bad. But then we're almost never drawing a card, since the aggressive deck will have deployed more cards from their hand. So two mana in that case to gain four life and make two one ones is the, the highest upside we're going to get from this, most likely. And then there's also circumstances where the opponent's just playing a more mid-rangey deck, and it's going to be pretty hard to get a ton of value out of this, I feel. It's just going to lead to a lot of awkward sequencing and uh, the eventual upside once you do get to the late game is not that high, 
just making a couple one ones or gaining a bit of life. So yeah, uh, I'm not sold on the Sunset Revelry. Of course, the best case scenario where all three things happen for two mana seems great. I just don't think it's going to happen often enough. So this gets a D. Finally, Thraben Exorcism. Two mana for an instant that exiles target spirit, creature with disturb or enchantment. So this doesn't quite make it to the main deck, I don't think, but will be an excellent sideboard card, especially against the disturbed decks. But uh, yeah, in a pinch, being able to exile a spirit for two mana, thinking again of the Hippogriff at five, this uh, seems like an efficient answer for those. But I don't think there's overall enough spirits uh, flying around in the main decks to warrant putting this in, in the main deck necessarily. But uh, a fine sideboard option. So, you know, I'll give this a D. But if you're playing best of three, this is one of the better cards to have access to. And then we have Unruly Mob, reprinted from the original Innistrad. A 2-mana 1-1 one, one human at common, saying whenever another creature you control dies, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the mob. So we'll keep growing over time. This will be at its best in the black-white sacrifice decks where you're actively sacrificing your own creatures and zombie tokens with Decayed. But uh, of course also a creature that just naturally grows over time. So will be a staple 2-drop in aggressive white decks. So yeah, seems fine. We'll give this a C. And then Vanquish the Horde, 8 mana for a rare sorcery, costs 1 less to cast for each creature on the battlefield, and it destroys all creatures. So a Wrath of God effect in Limited is always worth paying attention to, both when playing out your games, if you probably need to play around Vanquish the Horde if you're very far ahead on board. But uh, yeah, this one is a little tricky. Um, not as easy to set up as your typical 4 or 5 mana sweeper. So it, it feels more difficult to pull off those clean 3 for ones or what have you blowouts that you might get with your typical cheap sweeper. So it's probably going to require you to add more creatures to the board yourself just to be able to cast Vanquish the Horde to begin with, at which point you're not really getting as much advantage from it as before, because as soon as you're just going to do nothing for a couple turns, the opponent's going to suspect you have a sweeper in hand, and they're just going to stop playing into it. So I don't think this is quite as good as your typical sweeper and limited. That being said, it's still good, uh, just not quite bomb level good, so I think I'm leaning more towards a B for Vanquish the Horde just because um, I can see it being a little awkward to set up. First blue card is a bait hook angler, 2 mana for a 2-1 human peasant at common, with disturb for 1 and a blue. So kind of your bread and butter disturb common. And yeah, this is pretty decent. Again, I like it when my 2 drops have additional utility in the late game, and 2 mana 2 ones perfectly reasonable to play early. And then late game, the disturb cost lets us play a 1-2 flyer out of the graveyard. So nothing too impressive, but just gives us something to do. And being able to cast spells even in the late game is important to prevent your opponent from transforming their werewolves. Because uh, if you ever end up during your turn not being able to cast anything and the opponent has a couple of werewolves out, you're going to be in a lot of trouble if those all transform and it goes to nighttime. So that's another reason to like having access to lots of cheap cards you can keep casting until late in the game. The Angler gets a C plus from me, just a solid 2-drop that I'm always going to be happy with. Component Collector is next, a 3-mana 1-4 Homunculus at common. It says if it's neither day or night it becomes day. And whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, we get to tap or untap target non-land permanent. So the main use of this is preventing an opposing creature from attacking, can maybe block some decayed tokens, but uh, still not the most impressive stat line. The one thing worth noting I guess about blue is that it does have an easier time switching between day and night 
uh, especially switching from day to night because it will have access to more instants so it can easily pass the turn let it switch to night time and then cast something in the opponent's turn to still use its mana efficiently although the drawback is that of course all your opponent's creatures might turn into bigger scarier werewolves that deal more damage so there's uh, two sides to that coin so the component collector probably just a C filler card at best consider is definitely worth considering one mana instant that lets you take a look at the top card and then put that card into the graveyard if you want and then draw a card a strictly better version of opt especially in a set that cares about the graveyard synergies like flashback and disturb so this card seems great at the very least a c plus also great for the blue red spells decks that care about casting cheap instants and sorceries this is a, a c plus but verging on a b just because of how many synergies it has across multiple archetypes covetous castaway two mana one three human and uncommon when it dies mill three cards which as we mentioned is pure upside in a set filled with graveyard synergies and it has disturb for five mana which lets us cast a ghostly castigator a three four flyer that when it enters a battlefield we may shuffle up to three target cards from our graveyard into our library so some people really dislike milling cards because they might end up milling their bomb that doesn't have flashback or disturb well the ghostly castigator is a, a neat way to shuffle those powerful cards back into your deck so you still get a chance of drawing them and casting them so yeah the uh, castigator slash castaway seems like a solid two drop once again so c plus for ghostly castigator curse of surveillance five mana enchantment aura curse at rare enchants a player so for those not familiar with aura curses these typically enchant your opponent because uh you know that's usually how curses work you want to put them on someone else and in this case at the beginning of the enchanted player's upkeep any number of target players author than that player each draw cards equal to the number of curses attached to that player opponent's going to take their turn draw a card and then you get to draw a card for each curse attached to the opponent there's not a whole lot of curses in the set so for the most part we're looking at five mana and you get to draw cards in the opponent's draw step every turn so it's kind of your personal howling mine which is appealing you know getting to draw two cards per turn essentially the drawback of course is that we're paying five mana to initially not impact the board but you know it's still a card that's going to provide a lot of extra card advantage over time so especially in a deck that's filled to the brim with removal and author interaction curse of surveillance is pretty difficult to interact with since people shouldn't be main decking too many disenchants and uh yeah this will draw a lot of cards over time so i'm hesitant to give it too high of a grade since it is slow it doesn't necessarily impact the board so against any aggressive and uh, focused decks this will be almost a death sentence to tap out for on turn five but uh, you can always play it later in the game too so i'll, I'll go with c plus on the curse of surveillance as a more conservative grade but especially in sealed where things tend to be a little bit slower this is going to be much better than draft where you're more likely to face aggressive decks delver of secrets reprinted the one mana one one that at the beginning of your upkeep you get to look at the top card of your library and reveal that card if it's an instant or sorcery card then we get to transform delver of secrets and it turns into insectal aberration a three two human insect with flying so in the very dedicated blue red instant and sorcery deck where you might only have a handful of creatures including delver of secrets this is pretty strong as it might take you a turn or two to uh, transform it since of course your deck still has lands in it but if you can flip this early in the game having a three two flyer for one mana is just an incredible deal and this will very quickly close out the game for you so i think this falls somewhere in the c plus category with the caveat that it only really goes into the most dedicated spells decks 
Devious Cover Up reprinted, the 4 mana instant at common that counters target spell. If that spell is countered, that way we get to exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard, and we may shuffle up to 4 target cards from our graveyard into our library. So especially in decks that are doing a lot of self-milling, this is a way for you to recycle some of your win conditions. Uh, the loop of having a deck with two copies of Devious Cover Up means you essentially can never deck yourself because you can just keep putting Devious Cover Up back with another Devious Cover Up. So that's a powerful end game if you just want to annoy the opponent to death and just keep countering their spells over and over. But uh, yeah, that's technically a win condition. So in a controlling blue deck, maybe this goes into the blue red spells deck we were talking about. This uh, could be a powerful spell. The drawback of counter spells in a set with werewolves is if you pass a turn without impacting the board and the opponent controls a werewolf, you're going to be in a lot of trouble if you don't have some removal available. So counter spells can be effective, but can also have a severe drawback if you're not the one controlling the werewolves. End up giving Devious Cover Up a C. I think it's playable. I think there will be dedicated Devious Cover Up decks that use it as an actual win condition or just a great way to recycle more removal spells in the late game. But uh, it's also a card that can easily get punished by aggressive strategies. Dissipates another counter spell. This one is 3 mana at uncommon for an instant that counters target spell and then exiles it instead of putting it into the graveyard which of course has a lot of upside in a set with Flashback and Disturb. I think this gets a similar grade to Devious Cover-Up, just uh, the same comments I made about counter spells apply. Drownyard Amalgam is a 5 mana 3-6 zombie horror at common. When it enters a battlefield, target player mills 3 cards. I think you're going to want to target yourself most of the time, because targeting an opponent that may have Flashback and Disturb cards in their deck is asking for trouble. And for 3 mana we can activate the Amalgam to make it unblockable until end of turn. So a lot of stats, 3, 6 for 5, blocks pretty well, can enable graveyard synergies and then later in the game if you don't need it as a blocker it turns into an evasive win condition. So yeah, there's a lot uh, going for the Amalgam. Still it is 5 mana, the activated ability is pretty pricey, but I still like it. I think this is like a high C, but I uh, could easily see this moving up to the C+. Fading Hope is the strictly better unsummon, a 1 mana instant and uncommon that returns target creature to its owner's hand, but if its mana value was 3 or less we also get to scry 1. So this can still bounce your own creature, just as it can bounce opposing creatures and uh, the scry one is pure upside. So this feels like a pretty important card for the blue-red spells decks, especially ones that can also copy spells, because you need something cheap to copy, something to maybe catch you back up when you're behind on board, and while this doesn't permanently deal with anything, it buys you so much time if you can bounce some expensive creatures, it allows you to play it in some speed. So. Yeah, I think this is uh, going to be better than Unsummon might be in a typical set just because of the presence of that blue-red spells deck that uh, really needs access to high density of spells and this seems like a perfect fit alongside some card draw effects, so I'll give this a C+. Falcon Abomination, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two zombie bird at common, it flies and when it enters the battlefield it generates a decayed zombie token. So important for any deck that uh, cares about those zombie tokens, decks that maybe have sacrifice effects or uh, have other plans for the zombie tokens. And uh, yeah, we also get a 2-2 flyer for 3, so not a bad deal, assuming you can make use of the zombie token and a C plus seems appropriate. Firmament Sage is a 4 mana 2 3 human wizard at uncommon. If it's neither day or night, it becomes day as it enters. And when it switches from day to night or night to day, we get to draw a card. So this is an interesting card. It technically plays well with counter spells as we get to play the Sage and on the following turn, pass a turn without casting anything. 
it switches to knight, we draw a card, we get to keep up our counter spell, and then at some point we'll have to cast two spells to switch it back to daytime, but maybe the opponent cooperates and helps us with that as well. Not incredible stats, but this can easily draw a card or two over the course of a game, and uh, yeah, we'll also make sequencing for the opponent kind of awkward. Maybe they have two spells they want to cast, but they want to avoid doing so, since otherwise you get to transform back to daytime and draw a card with the sage. So yeah, this uh, could be pretty effective in the right deck, although it does require a little bit of setup in the sense that if your deck doesn't have a lot of instants, then you know it's going to be a little tricky to switch it to nighttime and back. I'm hopeful that this card is going to be good, so I'm going to go with a C plus, but uh, I could easily be wrong on this one. Flip the switch, a 3 mana instant at common, counters target spell unless its controller pays 4 mana, and creates a 2-2 zombie creature token with decayed. So whether or not the spell gets countered, you still get to make the 2-2 zombie token with decayed. Even if you're countering an uncounterable spell, you're still allowed to cast flip the switch and make that zombie token. That's a pretty niche interaction, but it could come up. Same comments that I made earlier about counter spells apply. This one seems okay, especially if your deck cares about those decayed tokens. I think just another C counter spell. Gale Drifter, a 4 mana 3 2 Hippogriff at common, it flies and it disturbs for 5 mana, and this time turns into a slightly smaller creature, turns into a 2 2 flyer. But uh, yeah, still upsides on top of an okay creature, 4 mana, 3-2 flyer, not exciting, but the disturb is pure upside, so there's still a lot to like about it. I'll give it a C+. Geist Wave is a 2 mana instant at common, which returns target a non-land permanent to Zoner's hand, and if you controlled that permanent you also get to draw a card. So under most circumstances you want to bounce opposing permanents. Every now and then you can save your creature from removal and draw a card in the process. Not as efficient as the 1 mana bounce spell, but there are circumstances where this will be slightly better. Although I think overall probably closer to a C than a C+. Grafted Identity is next, a 4 mana enchantment aura at rare. As an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice a creature, which shouldn't be too difficult given all the decayed zombies that are stumbling around. This enchants a creature, we control the enchanted creature, and it gets plus one plus one. So we want to put this on an opposing creature to take control of it. And yeah, this card seems great, an A level bomb. Larder zombie, one mana, one three zombie at common with defender and says you can tap three untapped creatures you control to look at the top card of your library, and we may put it into our graveyard. So the idea behind Larder Zombie and a few other cards we'll encounter is that we can tap the zombie alongside, maybe some decayed zombies that we don't want to attack with yet, and then use those to our advantage, in this case to fill the graveyard, maybe find some uh, disturbed creatures or flashback cards, and in the meantime, this is also 1-3 that can help us block. So there will be decks where this is actively a card you're interested in, decks with a lot of decayed tokens and a lot of graveyard synergies, but uh, on average I think this is probably still a D and not a card you're gonna be actively looking to main deck and probably can get pretty late in draft. And next is Lear, Disciple of the Drowned, 5 mana, 3, 4, mythic, rare, legendary human wizard, says spells cannot be countered. Now, Leer itself can still be countered, but once it's in play, that applies, and says each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard has flashback, and the flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost. So, giving all your spells flashback seems great, especially in, like, a blue-red spells deck, that I keep mentioning. So yeah, Leer seems like a, a bomb level card, assuming you have enough instants and sorceries to replay. 
Locked in the Cemetery is a 2-mana enchantment aura. Enchants an opposing creature, and when it enters the battlefield, if there are 5 or more cards in your graveyard, we get to tap the enchanted creature, and the enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. Of course, gets better the more ways we have of putting cards in our own graveyard, the more mill effects we have, but it's still a way to lock down a big scary creature from the opponent, and uh, that's going to be a necessary tool to have access to, especially when facing the various red-green werewolves. And uh, yeah, blue doesn't get a ton of actual removal. We get a few bounce spells and counter spells, but locked in the cemetery is one of the few ways to actually permanently deal with opposing creatures. So I think this is closer to a C plus than a C. Malevolent Hermit is a 2-mana, two 2-1 two human wizard at rare. For a blue mana we can sacrifice it to counter target a non-creature spell unless its controller pays 3 generic mana, and also has Disturb for 2 and a blue, in which case it turns into a 2-2 two two Benevolent Geist with flying that says non-creature spells you control cannot be countered. Yeah, this seems like another great card, easy to get a 2 for 1, and both sides are pretty efficiently costed. So I like an A for the 2-1. Memory Deluge is a 4-mana instant at rare. Let's just take a look at the top X card of our library, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast this spell. So if we cast it for its normal 4-mana cost, we get to take a look at the top 4. And then put 2 of those cards into our hand, and the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. But... Uh, the fun thing here is that it also has flashback, so if we flash it back for 7 mana, we get to take a look at the top 7 cards and put 2 of those into our hands. So a bit reminiscent of Dig Through Time, minus the whole Delph discount of course. But uh, still a powerful card draw effect, being an instant plays well with counter spells, and potentially lets you enable the day and night cycle or potentially plays well with other cards we've seen, like uh, the 4-mana creature that draws cards when it transforms back and forth. So yeah, I like at least a B for Memory Deluge as a powerful card draw effect. Mysterious Tome is a very interesting card to evaluate. A 3-mana artifact at Uncommon. For 2 mana, we can tap it to draw a card and then transform Mysterious Tome. So 5 mana to draw our first card is a pretty steep price, but what happens when it transforms? It becomes Chilling Chronicle, an artifact that we can activate for 1 mana, and then tap target non-land permanence, and then we transform it back. So this keeps transforming back and forth between drawing a card for 2 mana, and tapping target non-land permanent for 1 mana. Yeah, I mean, both abilities are pretty decent. Um, the sequencing and the timing is going to be tricky, since sometimes you'll need to not activate it in order to make sure the timing lines up with what the opponent is doing. The initial investment is pretty high to cast a Mysterious Tome, but assuming you can, you know, get past that initial investment, the uh, payoff is certainly there over time. So, yeah, I like it. Um, pretty flavorful too. I think I'm willing to give this a C+, plus, but uh, definitely a fun card and a cool design. Nebelgeist Intruder, a 3-mana 2-1 spirit at Uncommon, has Flash and Flying. And when the intruder enters the battlefield, up to one target creature an opponent controls gets minus two minus zero until end of turn. So a nice little ambush spirit that can mess up combat for the opponent. Also notably can mess up coven for the opponent by shrinking a creature's power to maybe let it line up with another creature's power. So another interaction that's uh, worth noting. And yeah, two one flyer with flash. Not exciting, but not the worst, so it'll probably falls somewhere in a C plus range. Ominous Roost, a 3 mana enchantment at Uncommon. And when the Roost enters the battlefield, or whenever we cast a spell from our graveyard, we get to make a 1 1 blue bird creature token with flying, and this creature can only block creatures with flying. So when we cast Ominous Roosts, 
we're not getting a whole lot of value so it's a very slow sort of uh, engine that will keep making more 1-1 one -one tokens although can't really block with them so roost of drakes this is not but it could be a fun engine card especially in i imagine like a simic uh, deck that has a lot of flashback and disturb synergies or maybe just blue white with uh, just disturb maybe a playable card in the right deck but i'm not super high on it just because it takes a while for it to actually be worth a card and uh, the tokens while nice for attacking are pretty single-minded so i think i'm still giving this a d but uh, definitely look forward to building around it a few times Next is Organ Hoarder, 4 mana, 3 2 zombie at common. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top 3 cards of your library, put one of them into your hands, and the rest into your graveyard. Now, this card's exciting. It's essentially drawing a card. It's even better than drawing a card. It's giving you a selection over which card to put into your hand, as well as filling the graveyard to potentially enable flashback and other graveyard synergies like uh, Disturb, and 3-2 for 4 is not too much worse than you would expect, especially in blue that doesn't get the largest creatures. So yeah, this card seems great. I think I'm even going up to a B, probably the best blue common I've seen so far. And Zombie also a relevant creature type. Author Worldly Gaze is a 1 mana instant at common that lets you look at the top 3 cards of your library, put any number of them into your graveyard, and the rest on top of your library in any order. So it's not actually drawing any cards. It does have flashback for one in the blue. So I want to like this card, but I, I just don't think it's good enough. Um, I could maybe see a very dedicated blue-red spells deck that needs to fill its graveyard at all costs to put more instants and sorceries in there. And then this is also a cheap way to enable some of your non-creature spell synergies. But in your average deck, I just don't see it happening. So this is probably a D. But uh, yeah, I could see, again, a very dedicated spells deck where we can put this to good use and probably get a lot of copies of this late since no one else wants them. And uh, yeah, who knows? Definitely worth experimenting with. Overwhelmed Archivist, a 3-mana, three 3-2 three, Human Wizard at Uncommon. And when Archivist enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card and then discard a card. So pure upside. And then a 3-2 that also has Disturb 4. And then turns into the Archive Haunt. A 2-1 Flyer that when it attacks, lets us draw a card and then discard a card. So we get to keep looting, improve our hands and uh, stats on both creatures here are pretty reasonable. So yeah, this is somewhere between a, a C plus and a B. Um, does it quite get to a B range? I think it might get there, just because of all the added value and card selection. And then of course, getting to loot in blue, pretty good with uh, all the flashback and disturb cards. So we'll, we'll give this a B, but probably a, a low end of the spectrum B. Patrician Geist, a 3-mana, 2-2 two, two Spirit Knight at rare with flying, saying other spirits you control get plus 1 plus 1, and spells you cast from your graveyard cost 1 generic mana less to cast. So, as we mentioned, Blue-White does have a bit of a spirit sub-theme, all the disturb creatures turn into spirits, and that 1-mana uh, discount also adds up, both with disturb and flashback. So, this is... Definitely a high B, especially in a deck with lots of uh, Spirits and Disturb cards. Phantom Carriage is a 6-mana 4-4 four, four Spirit at Uncommon. It flies, and when it enters battlefield, you may search your library for a card with Flashback or Disturb and put it into your graveyard and then shuffle. So a little bit expensive at 6-mana, although 4-4 four, four is pretty large, and it's pretty much is like... Uh, I guess drawing a card, maybe not quite, but uh, yeah, it definitely provides some form of card advantage, assuming you have some flashback or disturb cards to search up. So C+, plus, I think, for carriage. A little bit on the pricey side, but you definitely get your mana's worth. 
Puppet Stitcher is a 3 mana 2 3 human wizard at Mythic, saying whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, get to make one of those 2 2 black zombie creature tokens with Decayed. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 3 or more creature tokens, you may transform a Puppet Stitcher. So it's gonna take a little bit before we get to those 3 tokens, assuming they're all gonna be those Decayed tokens. Can maybe speed up the process with other tokens as well. And then once we do transform the Puppet Stitcher, it turns into Puppet Factory, a mythic artifact that says creature tokens you control lose all abilities and have base power and toughness 3-3. So now all of a sudden those decayed zombies turn into actual 3-3 creatures that can keep attacking and blocking. And at the beginning of your upkeep you may transform Puppet Factory. Maybe you've got additional instants and sorceries you want to cast to make more decades zombies but uh, we can always decide to keep it as the puppet factory. So this seems like a great payoff for the blue-black zombie decade deck. And uh, yeah, who knows, maybe even like a blue-white token deck that has other ways of making tokens can make good use of this. So seems like a powerful card for sure and I think gets to the A bomb category. Revenge of the Drowned is a 4-mana instant at common, saying a target creature's owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library, and you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with Decayed. So, pretty desirable effect. That uh, also happens to make a 2-2 zombie token kind of as an upside. This card would probably be okay even without the zombie token, but it's pure upside here. Now the opponent can choose to put the card on the bottom, Often these effects always put the card on top of the opponent's deck, so, you know, if, if they're in top deck mode, it kind of forces them to redraw a card they may not want to redraw. In this case, they do have the flexibility of potentially putting it on the bottom as well, but it's still essentially taking away a draw step from the opponent if they do decide to put it back on top, if it's a valuable creature. So, kind of like a one-for-one one that also generates a zombie token. So yeah, Revenge of the Drowned seems like a fine card, C+, and uh, of course gets better in decks that actually care about those decayed tokens. Secrets of the Key is a 1 mana instant at common that lets you investigate, so make a clue token you can sack for 2 mana to draw a card, and if the spell was cast from your graveyard with flashback, you get to investigate twice instead, and the flashback cost is 4 mana. So. It's essentially 3 mana to draw 1 card, and then if we flash it back it's 8 mana to draw 2 cards, but of course you can spread out the costs in uh, however way you want. So not a very mana efficient card. Now with that being said, it is a way to cast a lot of instants and sorceries, and uh, they're is a blue-red spell stack in the format that cares about casting lots of instants and sorceries, and you can even flash it back for a reasonable cost, if, especially if you get one of those creatures that give you a mana discount. So yeah, in those decks, Secrets of the Key is probably fine. Um, it's also a way to help you double spell, since it's just one mana, so a good way to turn it back to daytime if it's nighttime. Yeah, still not excited about it, since it's a lot of mana to get a few cards. Probably still gets a D, but uh, yeah, maybe the blue-red spells deck is going to be happy with a copy of this. Shipwreck Sifters, 2 mana for a 1-2 spirit at common. When it enters a battlefield, you get to draw a card and then discard a card. And whenever you discard a spirit card or a card with Disturb, you can put a plus one plus one counter on Shipwreck Sifters. So, you actively want to be discarding your spirits or disturb cards, otherwise this is not particularly impressive. But there are technically other cards in the set that let you draw and discard as well to help you grow the sifters. Um, yeah, still not really sold on it. Feels like most of the time you want to actually cast the creature with Disturb instead of just discarding it. Yeah, I don't know, I think this is probably still closer to a D than a C. Although, who knows, maybe there is a deck that 
has enough draw discard effects that this can pick up a plus one counter multiple times to actually become relevant. Scamp Wrangler, 2 mana for a 2-1 human wizard at uncommon, lets you tap 3 untapped creatures you control to then tap an opposing creature presumably. So 2 mana 2-1, two, that has a relevant late game ability I'm always interested in, and the Wrangler has natural synergy with those decayed zombie tokens that you often want to keep around instead of attacking with them until you can maybe do something more useful. And uh, yeah, using the Wrangler to tap down the opponent's largest and scariest creature is a good way to go about it. So yeah, I like the Wrangler. Uh, probably worthy of a C+. Sludge Monster, my preview card, 5 mana, 5-5 five, five horror at rare. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, put a slime counter on up to one target other creature and non-horror creatures with slime counters on them lose all abilities and have base power and toughness 2-2. Two, two. So this can potentially upgrade your decayed zombies into actual 2-2 two, two creatures that can keep attacking and blocking. It can downgrade large scary creatures from the opponent. And 5 mana 5-5 five, five is a lot of stats, so pretty much demands an answer from the opponent, otherwise it's gonna make it very difficult for them. So this seems like a bomb level card, and gets an A. Spectral Adversary, 2 mana, 2-1 two, Spirit at Mythic, part of the whole adversary cycle. So this is a 2-1 Spirit with Flash and Flying, and as the adversary enters the battlefield we may pay 1 on a blue any number of times, and when we pay this cost, 1 or more times, put that many plus 1 plus 1 counters on the adversary, and then up to that many other target artifacts, creatures and or enchantments phase out. So for a turn it's like they cease to exist and then they come back. So the fact that this has flash means we can phase out creatures in the opponent's turn um, in the middle of combats to essentially prevent a bunch of damage. Could also use this to phase out our own creature to maybe save it from removal. So it does have some flexibility to it, and even a 2 mana 2-1 two flyer uh, with flash is pretty decent, especially in a more aggressive deck. So a pretty flexible card. I don't think it's on the same power level as, uh, let's say, the white adversary, which is probably one of the best ones, to be fair. But uh, yeah, still a great card, and probably at least a high B. Don't think it quite gets to the A range. But a uh, fine card. Startle, 2 mana instant at common, saying target creature gets minus 2, minus 0 until end of turn. We get to make a decayed zombie, and we get to draw a card. So, yeah, fine card. Um, probably at its best in blue-green, as these effects typically are, that shrink power, since blue-green is the color pair that's going to have some beefy creatures that are going to force the opponent to maybe double block and then startle can be a blowout in the middle of combat. Although in blue-green you probably don't care too much about the decayed zombies. So it's a card that's a bit at odds with itself in that sense. But uh, yeah, on the surface this seems fine. Like you're not paying a whole lot of mana, it replaces itself and maybe you get one and a half cards worth out of it between killing a creature in combat and the zombie token but uh, there will also be situations where you're just cycling this and uh, making a decayed zombie. So yeah, probably just a C. Fine card, and will get better the more you care about the zombie token. Storm Rider Spirits, also a reprint. 5 mana, 3-3 three, three spirits at common with flash and flying. So probably not as good as it used to be, uh, still a way to potentially interact with the werewolf mechanic by passing the turn and letting it transform to nighttime, and it also plays well with counter spells as all flash creatures do. So yeah, it's uh, still not an impressive card, just a little bit inefficiently costed at 5 mana and gets a D, but uh, also not the most embarrassing card if you're low on playables. Suspicious Stowaway, one of the more exciting blue cards in the set, 
2 mana for a 1-1 one, one human rogue werewolf at rare. The suspicious stowaway cannot be blocked, and whenever the stowaway deals combat damage to a player, draw a card and then discard a card. So we get a 1-1 one, one looter, and this is a daybound card. So if it's daytime, this will enter as the human form. If it's neither day or night and we play this, it becomes day. And uh, the day and night cycle begins. If it's already nighttime and we play the stowaway, then it will enter the battlefield as Seafaring Werewolf, a 2 1 werewolf that cannot be blocked. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card full stop, so no discarding. So, yeah, this card seems amazing in the werewolf form, and even the human form is pretty good. So, this card's awesome and gets an A for awesome. And then we have Triskai Decafile, 2 mana, 1 3 human wizard at rare. Says you have no maximum hand size, and at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have exactly 13 cards in your hand, you win the game. And for 4 mana, we can draw a card as a nice activated ability. So the alternate win condition, probably not going to come up. But just uh, can kind of evaluate this as a 1-3 with an activated ability to draw cards with. So a mana sink in the late game. So yeah, as far as 2 drops that are still relevant in the late game go, this is a pretty good one. Now it's a bit of a pricey activated ability at 4 mana, but can kind of just see it as pure upside. But uh, I'll just go with C plus on the Triskai Decafile. Unblinking Observer is next a 2 mana 2-1 two homunculus at common that can tap to add blue to your mana pool. Spend this mana only to pay a disturb cost or cast an instant or sorcery spell. Yeah, fine cards, assuming you have lots of instants and sorceries or disturb cards. Um, although the problem with playing the Observer is if you're playing the blue-red spells deck that has the highest density of instants and sorceries, you really don't want to play a lot of creatures, and I don't think Observer makes the cut necessarily. But uh, yeah, as far as two drops go on the surface, this seems fine. So probably just a C. And Vivisection is very flavorful and I think also pretty powerful in this set. 4 mana sorcery at uncommon. As an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice a creature and then we get to draw 3. So perfect way to make use of a decayed zombie token. 4 mana draw 3, pretty effective. And uh, shouldn't be too difficult to get your hands on a zombie and uh, do some experimentation for science. So... This gets a C plus. First black card, Arrogance Outlaw. 3 mana for a 3-2 Vampire Noble at common, that when it enters a battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, each opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. You'll notice there's a bunch of these cards in black especially, that care whether or not the opponent lost life this turn, and uh, they're pretty strong if you can enable them. Although, of course, it's never a guarantee. And uh, Outlaw, I think, falls in that camp where if you can consistently enable it, I think it would be like a C plus at the very least. But uh, that's not always the case. So that also points to the importance of having early, especially evasive creatures that you can keep chipping in with to enable all these various aggressive vampire synergies. So as a whole... I think the Arrogance Outlaw is probably a C, but uh, gonna be a nice role player in the aggressive vampire decks. Bane Blade Scoundrel is a 4 mana 4 3 human rogue werewolf and uncommon. When the scoundrel becomes blocked, each creature blocking it gets minus 1 minus 1 until end of turn, so it makes it pretty difficult for the opponent to block it profitably. And this is another one of those daybound cards, as most werewolves tend to be. And if it's nighttime, we get a Bane Claw Marauder instead, a 5 4 with the same blocking ability. And whenever a creature blocking Bane Claw Marauder dies, that creature's controller loses one life. So that's a lot of power and toughness that we're not used to seeing in black. But uh, yeah, this card seems pretty decent if you're an aggressive deck 
the ability indeed reminiscent of flanking if you played Kamigawa. So seems like a decent card, probably just a C plus. Bat Whisper, a 4 mana, 4 2 vampire at common. When it enters the battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, create a 1 1 black bat creature token with flying. So, once again, a card that's pretty awesome if you can enable it. Although, if it's just a 4 mana 4 2, it's pretty disappointing. We'll trade for lots of 2 drops in the set. So, I think this is just a C, but uh, gonna be a fine curve filler in the aggressive vampire decks that can consistently deal damage to the opponent. Bladebrand is reprinted, and this is a great set to reprint it in. A 2 mana instant saying target creature gains death touch until end of turn, and it draws a card at common. So great combo with the decayed zombies, even though for the most part you want to use the zombies instead of uh, attacking with them, you can use them to, you know, tap them down to use various abilities or sacrifice them. Every now and then you will be turning them sideways, and when you do, it's nice to have a blade brand to punish the opponent for blocking your 2-2 with their larger creature. And uh, yeah, also plays well with first strike as always with death touch. So there's a few of those in the set. So in uh, black-white, this will pair well with the one drop that has first strike for instance. So yeah, fine role player. And uh, worst case scenario, you can cycle it, uh, but often you can trade a, a smaller creature for a larger creature and draw a card. Um, the only potential drawback is if the opponent can kill the creature you're targeting a response and deny you the card draw. But uh, yeah, this card seems pretty good. Uh, probably still just a C, but this is the type of C that you're always happy to have at least one copy, and some decks actively will want more. Blood Pact, a 3 mana instant at common, saying target player draws 2 cards and loses 2 life. Card draw comes at a cost in black, as it tends to do. But uh, being an instant does have its uses in a set with werewolves. And uh, yeah, can technically also use this like a sign in blood to target the opponent and deal the last two points of damage. So can also be a nice tool for an aggressive vampire deck, for instance. Um, still not an exciting rate, uh, three mana, two life, two cards. But being an instant again can be relevant if you want to switch it to nighttime. So I think this is just a C. Bloodline Culling 3 mana instant at rare lets you choose one between target creature gets minus 5 minus 5 until end of turn, or creature tokens get minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn. For the most part, we're going to be interested in the minus 5 minus 5, but having the flexibility of taking out a bunch of tokens, especially decayed tokens or the various coven tokens in the green-white deck maybe, could be useful. And 3 mana at instant speed is pretty efficient, so this seems like a premium removal spell and gets a B. Blood Tithe Collector, 5 mana for a 3-4 Vampire Noble at uncommon, it flies. And when a collector enters a battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, each opponent discards a card. So 3-4 four flyer for 5, similar to the Hippogriff, we gave a C. This of course has significant upside if the opponent lost life, so probably bumps it up to a C+, plus, but uh, has the same potential issues that the other vampires had if you cannot consistently deal damage to the opponent. So this is more of a curve topper and an aggressive vampire deck as opposed to anything else. Champion of the Perished is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one zombie at rare, a nice parody on Champion of the Perish. And whenever another zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on a Champion of the Perished. So great synergy in the blue-black zombie deck, works well with the decayed tokens and will uh, quickly get very large. So great one drop and no doubt is going to see some constructed play as well. And uh, as far as limited goes, this seems like a high B, a great one drop to start out your curve with. The main issue with this card, I guess, is that blue-black is not really an aggressive deck. 
So while it is a, a nice one drop that can be great for a curve out start, I don't know if uh, blue black is necessarily the best home for it, even though it's the place where you'll find most of the zombies. Covert Cut Purse is a 3 mana 2 1 human rogue and uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target creature you don't control that was dealt damage this turn. And uh, yeah, this is the type of effect we've seen a number of times in the past. And uh, yeah, we're used to seeing it on 3 mana 3 twos. And those cards are typically like a C level card, nothing special. In this case, we also have Disturb for 5 mana. And this is one of the better Disturb cards, I think, as we get a 2-2 Flying Death Touch Spirit Rogue. So while it is a little pricey at 5 mana, getting a Death Touch Flyer is like getting a creature that can trade for pretty much anything the opponent has, barring first strike or double strike. Yeah, this card's pretty good. I think even bumps it up to a B. Should be pretty easy to essentially trade for two of the opponent's creatures once maybe by attacking with a small token or even a, a decayed zombie token the opponent blocks and you get to take out their creature. And then uh, later in the game the 2-2 flying death touch is uh, likely to trade for something too. So yeah, lots of value to be had. Crawl from the cellar, a one mana sorcery at common, lets you return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand and put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target zombie you control and also has flashback for 4 mana. So the front half of casting this for 1 mana is incredibly efficient, especially if you're also putting a plus 1 counter on an actual zombie. If you put this on a decayed token it's not as impressive, but uh, putting it on an actual zombie is pretty good. And then also has flashback, so it can provide a ton of value. And uh, yeah, blue-black especially is not going to have a shortage of zombies. So big fan of Crawl from the Cellar in the right deck. Overall probably just a C, but uh, a card I'm looking forward to casting over and over. Next is Curse of Leeches, a 3 mana enchantment aura curse. This uh, I believe is the second we've seen so far. So this is another rare, so not a card type you're gonna encounter very often. Enchants a player, hopefully the opponent, and as this permanent transforms into Curse of Leeches, because this is a daybound card, so it's possible that it enters the battlefield as the other side, then we get to attach it to a player to make sure it works within the rules. And at the beginning of the enchanted player's upkeep, they lose one life and you gain one life. So we're used to seeing this effect. We've seen it as the Black Sanctum, which costs two mana. Uh, we've seen it as the... Uh, 4 mana enchantment in Ravnica. So this time we're paying 3 mana, but of course there's an interesting twist. Leeching Lurker is the Nightbound side, a 4-4 lifelinking creature. So if we ever flip this into the 4-4 lifelink, it's incredibly scary. Although on the other side, let's say the opponent has a removal spell and they want to get rid of your curse, they can wait for it to turn into nighttime to kill your Lurker to get rid of the enchantment. So there will be scenarios where turning into the Leeching Lurker is actually a drawback, but definitely an interesting design. And uh, I think as a whole the card's still quite good. Maybe not bomb level good, because it does give the opponent a chance to interact, but uh, still at least worthy of a B. And also a nice enabler for the vampire deck that needs to consistently let the opponent lose life to enable its synergies. Then Defenestrates is going to be one of the staple removal spells in the set. 3 mana instant at common, which destroys target creature without flying. Now, not killing creatures with flying is a pretty big drawback, often limited. You're gonna create a board stall with ground creatures, and then it's often the flying creatures that end up deciding a game, and in a set with Disturb that's gonna come up quite often and Defenestrate doesn't really offer a solution to that problem, but it's still 3 mana instant that kills anything else, so there will be a lot of uh, scenarios where this is just an excellent removal spell, but I don't think I can quite give it a B because of that big uh, drawback, so C plus 
probably still one of the better commons in black. A Diagraph Horde, 5 mana, 3 for zombie at common. When it enters the battlefield, create 2 decayed zombie tokens. And when you do, exile up to 2 target cards from graveyards. So the exile 2 cards part is a lot more relevant than it may appear again in a set that cares so much about graveyard cards and flashback and disturbed. And 3-4 uh, plus 2 zombie tokens for 5 is a lot of stats, even if, of course, a bunch of that is tied to those zombie tokens that can easily go away. But presumably, if you're playing black, you have a lot of ways to make use of those zombies between sacrifice effects and the various synergies in blue. So you can kind of see this more of a, a blue-black card than anything else. So, yeah. I think C plus for Diagraph Horde, assuming you can make good use of those decayed tokens. And part of that is also because the graveyard hate that's stapled onto it is so relevant in the set. Dreadhound is a 6 mana 6x six, six demon dog at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, mill 3 cards. And whenever a creature dies or a creature card is put into a graveyard from a library, each opponent loses 1 life. So you can even make the opponent lose life by milling yourself and revealing more creatures. 6-6 six, six for 6 is pretty big, but also pretty expensive. Doesn't have any evasive abilities. But uh, the static ability here of draining the opponents will definitely add up over time, especially if your deck has other ways of milling yourself. So I don't I don't hate the Dreadhound if you need a curve topper. I think you can definitely do worse. So that's a C plus for Dreadhound. Then the rest is back, uh, usually not a playable card, and uh, once again probably gets a D, which is probably generous. Should probably just be giving the rest an F, but D for the rest just sounds too good. Eaten alive, one mana sorcery at common, as an additional cost to cast it. Sacrifice a creature or pay four mana. And then you get to exile target creature or planeswalker. Exile here, of course, very relevant in a, a set with Disturb. And Eaten Alive seems like the perfect way to make use of a decayed zombie. Will play nicely in the black white sacrifice deck. And I think even an, at five mana, still, you know, a reasonable removal spell. So I think this will probably be the better of the two removal spells between this and Defenestrate. I think there's enough ways to enable Eaten Alive that uh, it's going to end up being the better of the the two commons. And uh, again, the fact that it exiles also cannot be underestimated. So we'll give Eaten Alive a B as an efficient removal spell. Ecstatic Awakener has a 1 mana 1 1 human wizard at common. For 3 mana, we can sacrifice another creature, draw a card and then transform the Awakener into a Woken Demon, which is a 4-4. So, neat way to, again, make use of those Decayed tokens. So we play this on turn 1. There's not that many ways to generate a Decayed token on turn 2, so it's unlikely that we're going to be attacking with a 4-4 on turn 3, but, you know, could always play some other creatures that we don't mind sacrificing on turn 2 and uh, set up the transformation, which also draws a card, so can kind of make up for the sacrifice creature in a way. And uh, yeah, 4-4 four, four. on turn 3 could be pretty backbreaking if you can set it up. So there's a lot to like about this. It's going to be great in the black-white sacrifice decks, although not every deck necessarily wants this if it doesn't have any creatures that it's happy to sacrifice to the ability, but uh, that being said, both blue-black and black-white should be relatively happy with this. Probably not a card you want in black-red, or in... yeah, maybe black-green can still get away with it, but uh, yeah, black-red is probably the least likely to be interested in this. So in all those other archetypes, this might even be a C+, as a whole, maybe closer to a C, but definitely a C with a lot of potential so could easily end up as a C plus overall. Foul play, two mana sorcery at uncommon. 
which destroys target creature with power 2 or less and investigates. So we get a clue token that can eventually draw us a card. Creatures with power 2 or less don't end up being the most impactful creatures typically, but the fact that we also eventually get an extra card out of it is uh, pretty nice. So as a whole, probably C+. I don't think I can give it a B, just because it doesn't actually deal with most. It it doesn't actually deal with most uh, problematic threats, but every now and then there might be a utility creature that this can still take out. A ghoulish procession, two mana enchantment at uncommon. And whenever one or more non-token creatures die, we get to create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with Decade. Only triggers once each turn. I want to like this card, since it's one of those engine cards that could provide a lot of value over time. The problem is, the turn you play it, it usually doesn't do anything. And it specifically says whenever one or more non-token creatures die, so... That does eliminate a lot of inherent synergies you would have in the set. So I think it's going to be kind of tricky to really get a ton of value out of this. And uh, probably going to end up giving this a D. Then we have a Gisa, a Glorious Resurrector. 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, a legendary human wizard at rare. Saying if a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. Very relevant. And at the beginning of your upkeep, put all creature cards exiled with Gisa onto the battlefield under your control, and they gain Decayed. So 4-4 four, four with a ton of upside in this set. Not sure what more I can say about it. Just an excellent card, great stats. Even if you're not making a whole lot of Decayed tokens, just a threat of exiling the opponent's creatures is already pretty huge, so seems like a pretty big headache for the opponent to deal with, and gets an A. And then we have a Graveyard Trespasser, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three, Human Werewolf and Rare, and it has wards, forcing the opponent to discard a card if they target it with an ability or a removal spell. And whenever the Trespasser enters the battlefield or attacks, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. And if a creature card was exiled this way, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So this is another Daybound card. And uh, already, 3-3-3 three three, three with a ton of upside in black. Black usually doesn't really get these very efficiently costed creatures, that's usually more of a green thing. But uh, yeah, this is just all pure upside. And I can't stress enough how important these free quote-unquote uh, graveyard hate abilities are stapled onto your creatures because the graveyard is often gonna decide the late game in limited and uh, this just gives you an easy way to get rid of the opponent's late game and then of course there's still the knight side of the card which is graveyard glutton which is a 4-4 with the same award ability but instead of exiling one card, the Glutton can exile up to two target cards from graveyards when it enters a battlefield or attacks, and then still drains the opponent for one if a creature is exiled this way. So I think this card's great, and uh, I'm going to bump it up to an A, just because I think that graveyard hate ability is just going to be so impactful in a lot of limited games. Heirloom Mirror is another very flavorful card, 2 mana, artifact at uncommon. 1 mana, tap it, pay a life and discard a card. In order to draw a card, mill a card and then put a ritual counter on the Heirloom Mirror. Then if it has 3 or more counters on it, remove them and transform it. And then it transforms into the Inherited Fiend. A 4-4 demon with flying, which for 2 and a black can exile target creature card from a graveyard and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So once again, a useful graveyard hate ability, stapled onto a 4-4 flyer, which is pretty big for this set. So let's do the math here. Heirloom Mirror, we pay 2 mana for it, and then over the course of 3 turns, we pay 3 additional mana, pay 3 life, and then essentially get to loot three times, get to discard and draw. So eventually we end up paying five mana and three life for 
the 4-4 flyer, which can then keep on growing, can maybe even discard some creatures to enable its ability once it transforms. So if we play this early, uh, it seems like a pretty good deal. In the late game, the problem, I guess, is that it's going to take us three turns before we can actually transform it, which might be too late. But uh, it does still let us potentially improve our hands, maybe discard some lands we don't need. So it does have a lot going for it. And uh, yeah, for for flyer that eats up the graveyard seems pretty strong. So I think I'm willing to uh, go all the way up to a B for the heirloom mirror. But uh, time will tell. Hobbling zombie, three mana, two two zombie at common with death touch, and when it dies, create a two two zombie token with decayed. So, fine card. Um, trades for large werewolves, or at least prevents them from attacking. And uh, probably plays well in the sacrifice decks. So great in blue black, great in black white, and. Uh, even in an aggressive vampire deck, a 2-2 death touch, the opponent is not always willing to block and then it can enable those vampires that need you to deal damage to the opponent. So overall, just a solid role player that fits into a lot of different decks and uh, probably gets a C+. Infernal Grasp, 2 mana instant at uncommon which destroys target creature, you lose 2 life. So this card is going to see a ton of constructed play as well, I'm sure. And as far as limited is concerned, it doesn't get much better than this. Premium removal spell at instant speed gets a B. Jadar, Ghoul Caller of Nephalia, 2 mana, 1-1 one, one legendary creature, human wizard at rare. Says at the beginning of your end step, if you control no creatures with Decayed, we get to make a 2-2 black zombie creature token with Decayed. On turn 2. We get a 1-1 one, one, and we get to make a Decayed Zombie right away. If we want to keep getting value from Jadar, we probably want to be attacking with our Decayed Zombies or maybe sacrificing them. But um, yeah, this seems like an incredible engine card, especially in the Sacrifice deck. In the blue-black zombie deck, it's still, of course, fine. It's going to be good in any black deck. Uh, also in the Vampire decks, great way to keep getting in damage with your Decayed Zombie. But... Uh, probably going to be at its best in a black-white sacrifice deck that can keep on sacrificing your decayed zombie over and over, as opposed to the blue-black zombie deck, which typically wants to hoard a whole bunch of zombies until it can do something with them. So um, yeah, great card, going to be an awesome turn to play if you can get it, and uh, get a B. Then we have Jaren, Corrupted Bishop, 3 mana, 2 3, Human Cleric. It's legendary and it's mythic. And when Jaren enters the battlefield, or another non token human you control dies, you lose one life and create a 1 1 white human creature token. We're paying 3 mana and 1 life for a 2 3 and a 1 1 human token, which is, uh, you know, pretty good deal. And then if a non-token human we control dies, we lose a life and make a token. Doesn't seem like that's going to be something that happens every turn. And uh, maybe not even every other turn. So for the most part, we can evaluate this as a 3 mana 2-3 that makes a 1-1. One, one. And then uh, very rarely we'll make additional 1-1s. One, but then there's more. For 2 mana, target human we control against lifelink until end of turn. And uh, yeah, that ability is good with a human token. We can use it on Jaren himself and any other human we might already have in play. And then there's more. At the beginning of your end step, if you have exactly 13 life, you may pay 6 mana if you do transform a Jaren. So all those life loss and life link abilities make it a little bit easier to fine tune your life total to a point where you can end up at 13 life and then pay the 6 mana and transform into Ormondal the Corruptor. 6-6, six, six, a legendary demon with flying, trample, a lifelink, and you can sacrifice another creature to draw a card. So perfect with all those human tokens you might have left behind. So yeah, this card's awesome, uh, very flavorful, seems good without being overpowered. 
uh, for limited, also a decent card without being impossible to deal with, uh, but still easily an A bomb level card. Lord of the Forsaken, 6 mana, 6-6 six, six demon at mythic, has flying, trample, and for a black mana we can sacrifice another creature, in which case target player mills 3 cards, and we can also pay 1 life and colorless mana to spend to cast spells from our graveyard. So just a very big flying creature that will end the game in a few attacks, and at the same time can further enable the graveyard synergies, probably not going to be milling the opponent a whole lot, but uh, interesting way to synergize with our graveyard as well between Disturbed and uh, Flashback. So another bomb level card, even if it is a little pricey. Then Mask of a Grizzlebrand, 3 mana legendary artifact equipment at rare. The set doesn't have many equipments, not many artifacts, so that's Probably a good thing for Mask of Whistlebrand because it means people won't be main decking a whole lot of dedicated artifact hate. And the equipped creature has Flying and Life Link, equips for 3 mana. And whenever the equipped creature dies, you may pay X life where X is its power if you do draw X cards. So reminiscent of the original Gristlebrand's activated ability somewhat. And uh, yeah, Mask of Gristlebrand. A little bit expensive to get going, 6 mana before we start reaping the rewards, but uh, a lot of ways we can make good use of this. It's even good with decayed zombies, since you can essentially pay 3 mana, attack for 2, pay 2 life, draw 2 cards, while you know the, the life link essentially pays for the ability. So it turns into 3 mana, draw 2 cards over and over. And... Uh, of course, we can put it on any other creature as well. Makes it very difficult to race. The, the lifelink kind of pays for the ability if we decide to use it. And it is a May ability, so we don't have to pay the life. Incredibly powerful card. If we can get to the point where we can consistently equip it, draw cards with it, etc. There will be games where we spend 6 mana equipping it, the opponent has a bounce spell or a removal spell, and we're hopelessly behind because we spent 6 mana doing nothing, so we have to outweigh that as well with uh, the games where it will eventually carry us to victory. So I'm going to end up giving Mask a B, but a card with an incredible amount of potential for sure. The Meat Hook Massacre, Axe and Double Black for a Mythic Rare Legendary Enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. Whenever a creature we control dies, each opponent loses one life. Whenever a creature an opponent control dies, we gain one life. We're mostly interested in casting this and wiping the board, which may be difficult if we're facing some large werewolves, because those tend to have a lot of power and toughness, and uh, we have to pay two additional mana on top of giving minus X minus X. So if the opponent's curving out, uh, the Meat Hook Massacre won't necessarily be able to kill many creatures, so it's more of a card we want to cast after having already stabilized, and uh, then it can be indeed a Massacre, as the name implies, and drain the opponent for a bunch, and then the enchantment will stay in play and keep applying to future trades. So there's a lot to like about the Meat Hook Massacre. It doesn't quite have the same catch-up potential as your typical sweeper has, just because of having to pay the extra two mana and the set having some potentially very large creatures ahead of the curve, but still at the very least a B. Then we have Morbid Opportunist, a three mana, a one three human rogue at uncommon, saying whenever one or more other creatures die, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So it doesn't specify non-token creatures, so great with decayed zombies. And uh, probably pretty good in the black-white sacrifice deck, which can keep on sacking stuff to draw more cards. We can draw a card in our turn, we can draw a card in the opponent's turn potentially. Uh, so it doesn't seem too difficult for this to get out of hand. But uh, yeah, I think this is a B 
uh, card that you probably have to build around a little bit to get the most out of it, but the reward is certainly there. Morkrut Behemoth, 5 mana for a 7-6 Zombie Giant at common. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a creature or pay 1 on a black, in which case it's 7 mana. But if we can cast it for 5 mana and sack a creature, we get a 7-6 with Menace. So of course, interested in sacrificing those Decayed Zombie tokens. And 5 mana for a 7-6 Menace is huge. Unless the opponent has like a white removal spell or a blue bounce spell or a counter spell. Most uh, red and green removal spells are going to have a hard time getting past the 7-6. So yeah, Behemoth is uh, no joke and I think easily gets a C plus since there's so many ways of generating zombie tokens that we can sacrifice to pay for it. Necrosynthesis is a 2 mana uncommon enchantment aura. We want to enchant our own creature, and it says whenever another creature dies, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. And when the enchanted creature dies, we get to look at the top X cards of our library, where X is its power, and put one of those cards into our hand, the rest on the bottom of our library. So I have a few issues with Necrosynthesis. First, it's kind of slow to get going. The immediate rewards isn't really there. Slowly get some plus one counters. Now, it does potentially solve one of the issues I have with Auras, which is getting two for one, since you can essentially uh, draw an extra card with the ability when the creature dies. The problem comes when the removal doesn't actually kill the creature, maybe it exiles, and uh, we don't get to trigger it, maybe our creature gets bounced. So there's just a ton of situations where we don't actually get to draw the extra card, and the benefit just isn't there. So this gets a D. No way out, 3 mana sorcery at common, and uh, this is the mind rot effect in the set. And besides making the opponent discard two cards, we also get to make a decayed zombie token. So yeah, decent card. Now, one thing to, I guess, keep in mind is that Discard effects probably aren't as impactful in this set as they would normally be, just because so many cards have flashback and disturbed, so making the opponent discard two cards in some rare circumstances could actually be helping the opponent. If they have some good disturbed cards, they would rather just be casting out of the graveyard. That being said, it's still probably a fine card. Make him discard two could be a two for one, and making a decayed zombie if you've got any way of... Uh, making use of that zombies a nice upside. So probably still just a C, but uh, I think it's probably a, a fine mind rot effect. And uh, if aggressive decks aren't too oppressive, it's probably a card you could main deck some amount of the time. If red-black vampire decks that curve out or red-green werewolf decks are beating your face in, then you probably don't have time to cast this, but we'll see. Novice Occultist, 2 mana, 1 to Human Wizard at common. And when the Occultist dies, you draw a card and you lose one life. I would much prefer to draw the card when it enters the battlefield as opposed to when it dies. But uh, let's say in the Sacrifice deck, it shouldn't be too difficult to make that happen. And in the meantime, a 1 2 for 2 mana is not a bad blocker, I suppose. So, yeah, fine card, just probably a C. Then Olivia's Midnight Ambush, 2 mana instant, add common, giving target creature minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn, unless it's night time, in which case it gets minus 13, minus 13 instead. So nice removal spell, a bit conditional, there's not always going to be a day and night cycle happening, so some amount of the time it's only minus 2, minus 2, but that's still a nice way to shrink down an opposing creature and then we can still block it and uh, more easily take it out. So still easily a C plus. Rotten Reunion, one mana instant at common that exiles up to one target card from a graveyard while making a 2-2 zombie token with Decayed and also has a flashback for one and a black. So the Decayed zombies, probably not even worth half a card is my guess. 
but add on to that that this gives you graveyard hate that can take away resources from the opponent. We can do it a second time with flashback. Gives us a spell for decks that care about casting spells. Gives us zombies for decks that care about zombies or sacrifice fodder. I think as a whole adds up to a playable card that I'm probably happy to main deck in a lot of black decks. So I think this gets a C, whereas most people would probably look at it and give it a D. Then we've got Shady Traveler, 3 mana, 2 3 human werewolf at common with Menace and Daybound. So 2 3 Menace for 3, not an exciting card, but if we turn it into Nighttime, it is a Stalking Predator, which is a 4 4 with Menace instead. So definitely a lot more impressive when it's Nighttime. And uh, yeah, Menace also a useful keyword for enabling the uh, vampire deck that needs to be dealing damage to the opponent. So that's uh, another upside, and 2-3 can also block those decayed zombies. So overall, seems like a C+. Siege Zombie has a 2-mana 2-2 two two at common, and can tap 3 untapped creatures we control, and then each opponent loses 1 life. So a 2-drop on turn 2 can attack and block, and then in the late game plays well, especially with a bunch of decayed zombies, so we can keep slowly draining the opponent. So yeah, a fine 2-drop. Um, don't think it quite gets to the C plus range, just because the ability is going to require quite a bit of setup before it actually becomes relevant. But uh, yeah, still a 2-drop. I'm happy to play on turn 2 to fill out my curve especially in a deck with a lot of decayed zombie tokens. Slaughter Specialist, a 2-mana rare Vampire Warrior. It's a 3-3, and when the Specialist enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 white human creature token, and whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Slaughter Specialist. So, seems like a pretty decent card, especially in a deck that has a couple removal spells to back it up, a 3-3 that will grow over time. Sure, the opponent gets a 1-1 token that they can use to chum block, but at the same time it also gives us a way to keep growing the specialist. So this gets, at the very least, a B. And then we have the Stromkirk Blood Thief, 3 mana for a 2-2 Vampire Rogue at Uncommon. Saying at the beginning of your end step, if an opponent lost life this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target vampire you control, which includes the blood thief itself. Does not have flying despite being in midair, but uh, yeah, still seems like a decent card in an aggressive vampire deck. Maybe not a card you want to play on turn three, but more of a card you can play later in the game once you've established a few evasive threats. But if you can play it on turn three and trigger the ability, then you could easily uh, snowball some uh, plus one counters and make it very difficult for the opponent to recover. So yeah, C plus for the Blood Thief, assuming you can enable it. Then Tainted Adversary is the Mythic Rare in black. 2-3 Zombie for 2 mana with Death Touch. And when Adversary enters the battlefield, we can pay 2 in a black any number of times. And when we pay this cost one or more times, put that many plus one plus one counters on the adversary and create twice that many 2-2 two -two zombie tokens with Decayed. So we get a 2-mana two 2-3 two Death Touch, which is pretty effective, definitely above the curve. For 5-mana we get a 3-4, as well as two zombie tokens with Decayed. If we ever get to 7-mana, we get a 4-5 Death Touch, and we get to make four zombie tokens with Decayed. So, in all of those circumstances, we get a creature that's definitely much better than average. And, uh, yeah, not much to complain about. It's going to be at its best in probably blue-black that can make best use of the decayed zombies. But any deck that's playing black is going to be quite happy with this at any spot in their curve. So, don't think this quite gets to the S category, but uh, easily a bomb-level card. And then a Vampire Interloper, another reprint from the original Innistrad. 
2 mana, 2-1 two Vampire Scout at common with flying, and a Vampire Interloper cannot block. But the uh, red-black aggressive Vampire deck wants to be turning its creatures sideways anyway, and having that stable onto an evasive creature seems uh, like a pretty good deal. So, great way to enable our Vampire Synergies that care about dealing damage to the opponent. Probably the most important to drop for the red-black Vampire deck, at least at common. So, easily a C+, but in the red-black Vampire Aggro deck you can kind of treat this as a B level card, just super important that you get as many of these as you can get your hands on, pretty much. Then Vengeful Strangler, 2 mana for a 2-1 Human Rogue at Uncommon. Strangler cannot block, but when the Strangler dies, return it to the battlefield transformed under your control attached to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. And if it transforms, it transforms into Strangling Grasp and Enchantment Aura, enchanting a creature or planeswalker and opponent controls, and at the beginning of their upkeep, or rather at the beginning of your upkeep, the Enchanted Permanence controller sacrifices a non-land permanent and loses one life. So they can immediately sacrifice the Enchanted Permanent, or they can try to hang on to it, but they will slowly lose more permanence and more life over time. Now, the Strangler cannot block, so the only way to make it transform is to attack and have the opponent block and trade, or just uh, make sure it dies. Or we can sacrifice it, so that's probably where this will be at its best, is in a deck with a lot of sacrifice effects. So, assuming you have a few ways of sacrificing the Strangler, then um, this should be a solid card and probably gets a C+. First red card, Abandon the Post. A 2-mana sorcery at common, up to 2 target creatures cannot block this turn, and has flashback for 3 in a red. So, a card that clearly wants to go in a very aggressive deck that only cares about turning its creature sideways, so the red-black vampire deck comes to mind, maybe even the red-green werewolf deck can make use of this. Not a card you're going to be interested in outside of those, but uh, yeah, could be a fine finisher that you can technically even cast twice in the same turn for 6 mana to prevent 4 creatures from blocking. So I think this gets a C, a role player in very aggressive decks. Ardent Elementalist, 4 mana for a 2-1 human shaman at common. When it enters battlefield, return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. So, not incredibly mana efficient at 4 mana, and it's also no guarantee that there's an instant or sorcery waiting for us in the graveyard to get back, so definitely worse than a 2-1 that draws a card in a lot of circumstances, although in the late game it's probably better than drawing a card since you get to draw a very good card most of the time if you've got removal. That being said, uh, I think it's probably just a C, a card that you may want in the more dedicated decks with lots of instants of sorceries, but um, not a card I'm necessarily excited about. Bloodthirsty Adversary, on the other hand, I'm quite excited about. 2 mana for a 2-2 Mythic Rare Vampire with haste, and as all the adversaries, as it enters the battlefield, we may pay a certain cost, in this case 2 in a red, any number of times, and when we pay this cost one or more times, put that many plus 1 plus 1 counters on the adversary, and then exile up to that many target instant and or sorcery cards with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard, we get to copy them and cast any number of those copies without paying their mana costs. So if we played for 2 mana we get a 2-2 Vampire with Haste, which is a fine card to have in the aggressive Vampire deck, but things get a lot more exciting once we get to the late game. 5 mana for a 3-3 Haste that gets to play a 3 or cheaper card for free, and uh, if we ever get to 7 mana, 4-4 four, four haste that gets to cast 2 spells for free potentially. So a card with a lot of potential, assuming we have the instants and sorceries to back it up, but under most circumstances this will be a bomb, so we'll give it an A. Brimstone Vandal, 3 mana, 2-3 devil at common with menace, and this is one of those day or night watchers. So enters the battlefield, turns it to daytime, 
and as nighttime or daytime changes, it deals one damage to each opponent. So yeah, nice a little card, two three menace, another good way to enable the vampire synergies in black red as well. And those uh, extra one points of damage can also help you enable them. So seems like a fine card, C plus. Burn down the house, five mana, sorcery at rare. Get to choose one between dealing five damage to each creature and each planeswalker, or create three 1-1 one, one red devil creature tokens that when they die deal one damage to any target, and they also gain haste until end of turn. So this card seems awesome. Just the fact that it does have two modes is just pure upside. For the most part you would be happy with uh, dealing five to each creature as a nice five mana sweeper that deals with you know, not every creature necessarily, but most creatures. But the fact that it also has this flexibility of making the devils is just pure upside. And uh, yeah, this gets an A. Powerful sweeper with even more flexibility. Burn the Accursed. Five mana instant at common deals five damage to a creature and two damage to that creature's controller and also exiles the creature if it would die. Exiling of course very relevant in this set and uh, yeah while five mana is a little bit pricey it does get the job done while dealing two damage to boot so reminiscent of Faraday's fireball from Forgotten Realms and uh, yeah a little bit easier to cast always deals two damage to the opponent without taking two and exiles so seems like a perfectly serviceable removal spell gets a C plus Cathartic Pyre is a 2 mana instant and uncommon, which deals 3 damage to target creature or planeswalker, and also has a flexibility to let you discard up to 2 cards and then draw that many cards. Not an incredibly efficient rate since you're essentially losing out on at least one card in that process, because you have to actually, you know, cast the Cathartic Pyre as well. But, you know, it's just pure upside stapled onto an already very efficient removal spell that deals 3 for 2 mana, so nothing to complain about. This is a B. Curse of Shaken Faith, 2 mana, enchantment, aura, curse at rare, enchanting the opponent, and whenever the enchanted opponent casts a spell, author than the first spell they cast each turn, or copies a spell, the curse deals 2 damage to them. Yeah, this card's not very good, the opponents can sort of play around it if they really want to and it's just probably not going to be worth the card at the end of the day. The times where the opponent is double spelling, they're more likely to be playing an aggressive deck where they can sort of ignore the two damage and uh, yeah other decks can kind of plan around it in a way. So yeah not a card I'm very interested in, just gets a D. Maybe if you've got other curses that get better if you have a lot of curses out. I could see this getting a little bit better, but there's not many of those. Electric Revelation, 3 mana instant at common. As initial cost to cast it, discard a card and draw two. So an effect we've seen in the past, although we typically got a, a treasure token as well. But this also has the upside of flashback for 3 and a red. So a little bit of card filtering and uh, probably a good way to fill your graveyard for the decks that care about having instants and sorceries in the graveyard, as we'll uh, find out. So yeah, I think this is just a, a playable filler card in red. Not a card you necessarily want a ton of copies of, but especially in the deck that cares about instants and sorceries, I'm probably going to be happy to have at least one of these. Falcon Wrath Perforator is a 2 mana 2-1 two vampire at common, and when the perforator attacks it deals one damage to defending player. So essentially attacks as a three powered creature sort of. Um, it can be a downside if the opponent has a three toughness creature that would otherwise trade but it can also be an advantage as you're guaranteeing at least one damage which can set up some of your synergies that care about the opponent losing life and can get that last point of damage in even if the opponent has a million blockers out. So I think this will be an important 2-drop for the Red Black Vampire deck, much like the Interloper. Probably not as good as the Interloper, but I'm still going to give this one a C plus as well. Falcon Wrath 
Pit Fighter, 1 mana for a 2-1 Vampire Warrior at rare. And uh, even if it just stopped here, 1 mana 2-1 Vampire in a, you know, a color that is very interested in having aggressive vampires, especially at 1 mana, this is already like a C+, but it just happens to have a little bit of extra text. 2 mana, discard a card, sacrifice a vampire, draw 2 cards, can only activate this if an opponent lost life this turn. So, you know, not an ability we expect to activate a whole lot necessarily, but it's just upside on a creature that's already fine. I think the Falconrath Pit Fighter will be a card you're pretty happy with in your aggressive red-black vampire deck. So I'll give it a B, probably a lower B than uh, some other ones we've given so far, but a B nonetheless. Famished Foragers, 4 mana for a 4-3 Vampire and common. When it enters the battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, add triple red to your mana pool. And for 3 mana we can discard a card and draw a card, so it can potentially activate its own ability if we don't have anything else to spend the 3 mana on, assuming we can you know, get there, which is not a guarantee, but that's why you need to draft those aggressive 1 and 2 drops, especially the evasive ones, so you can keep enabling these various vampires. And uh, yeah, if we get to play foragers plus another creature for 3 mana, we can very quickly get ahead on board. But the vampire deck feels like a very snowball-y deck in a sense, that uh, if it doesn't get off to a good start, all your cards are going to be below average, but if you do get off to a good start, then uh, it's going to be pretty difficult for the opponent to come back. So the Famished Foragers, where do we land on it? Probably a C+, assuming again you've got enough ways to enable it, but uh, seems like a nice mana sink in the late game too, if nothing else. Then we've got Fangblades, a Brigands, a 4 mana, 3-4 Human Werewolf and Uncommon and has a nice mana sync ability for 1 in the red, getting plus 1 plus 0 and first strike until end of turn. So this is incredibly difficult to block profitably if you're attacking with, let's say, 4 mana or 6 mana and triple red. And it's a, a werewolf, so it's the daybound side we're looking at, and the nightbound side is a 4-5 fangblade eviscerator, which has the same mana sync ability, but we can also activate it for 5 mana, in which case creatures we control get plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So probably gonna be at its best in like a red-white deck that can make a bunch of tokens, but you know it's gonna be a, a great card in any red deck and uh, easily gets a B. Festival Crasher 2 mana 1-3 Devil at common says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, the Crasher gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So great for the blue-red spells deck. So this might be one of the few creatures that deck actively wants, and hopefully that deck can get them, since not many other decks should be interested in this. And uh, yeah, in the blue-red spells deck, this is easily a C+. Then we've got Flame Channeler, a 2-mana 2 2-2 two -two human wizard at uncommon. Says whenever a spell you control deals damage, transform Flame Channeler. So deals damage, doesn't have to deal damage to a player, dealing damage to a creature is also fine. So any burn spell should transform this into Embodiment of Flame, a 3-3 Elemental Wizard. Says whenever a spell you control deals damage, put a flame counter on the Embodiment. For one mana we can remove a flame counter to exile the top card of our library, and we may play that card this turn. So nice card advantage engine, and all it asks from us is that we cast a 2 mana 2-2, two -two, which you know is totally fine on curve, and then at some point we deal damage with our burn spell, which we undoubtedly have in our red deck, and then it turns into a 3-3, three -three, so we get a nice little upgrade that will maybe provide a bit of card advantage over time. So yeah, a lot to like about this, gets a B. Geist Flame Reservoir, 3 mana artifact at rare, saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell put a charge counter on it. For 2 mana we can tap it, remove any number of charge counters from the reservoir, and it deals that much damage to any target. Or we can pay 2 mana tap it and exile the top card of our library, and we may play that card this turn. 
playing means we can also play lands, which is a distinction from casting. So that's nice. That being said, um, we can sort of draw a vague comparison between the Reservoir and the Blue Book that we have uh, already covered. That was 3 mana to play and then 2 mana to draw a card. This is 2 mana to exile the top card, which is definitely worse than drawing a card, because you may not want to cast a card that is exiled or the timing might not quite be right. And then the, the first set of abilities of um, removing charge counters will require a lot of instants and sorceries to be cast before it really does anything. In a very dedicated blue-red spells deck it's probably playable, outside of it not really, so um, even in blue-red spells I'm not ecstatic about this. So this is a C at most, probably closer to a D in most circumstances. Then we have the Harvest Tide Infiltrator, 3 mana, 3 to Human Werewolf at common, it tramples. This is the Daybound side. The Nightbound side is a bit more exciting, 4-4 four, four Trampler. Not sure how commonly the Nightbound side will come into effect, that's something uh, time will tell as we play the set. But uh, yeah, assuming we can uh, get the 4-4 four, four Trampler going. I think this is at the very least a C plus. Immolation is a one mana enchantment aura at common. Enchants a creature, giving it plus two, minus two. So we can use this to boost up our own creature, but for the most part I imagine this is equivalent to dealing two damage to an opposing creature. Uh, so a way to take out smaller creatures or finish off a creature that's dealt damage some other way. Um, yeah, not super thrilled about this, definitely not as good as a shock since it's not an instant and doesn't have those instant or sorcery synergies, so probably just a C. Lamphold, Harrier, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two wolf, and it's a common, and for 4 mana, target creature can't block this turn. So 2 mana, 2-2 two, two with upside, I'm always interested in, and the upside here is pretty relevant for an aggressive deck, so happy giving this a C+. A light up the knights, X and a red for a sorcery at rare, dealing X damage to any targets. It deals X plus one damage instead if that target is a creature or planeswalker. You know, it scales perfectly with the amount of mana we sink into it if we're targeting a creature. And in the late game, if the opponent's low on life, this could just burn the opponent out. So it's pure upside. Uh, the flashback is not going to come up very often since it requires removing loyalty counters from a planeswalker we control. So for the most part we can ignore it, but uh, yeah, straight up it's just a nice burn spell that deals with creatures early and in the late game can potentially be a nice win condition too, so we'll give this a B. Lunar Frenzy, X and a red for an instant at uncommon, saying target creature you control gets plus X plus O and gains first strike and trample until end of turn. So as far as combat tricks go, this uh, could be quite a blowout. First strike and trample, good combination, and uh, probably going to be at its best in like a red-green werewolf deck where you can give a large green creature trample, but it can also sort of act as a burn spell to finish off the opponent in a sense. As long as you have enough creatures that are attacking, you can also cast it for x equals zero just for the first strike sometimes. I like it, uh, probably still just a C. Don't think I can give it much more than that, as still just a, a combo trick that does require the right circumstances, but uh, can be a fine finisher. Moonragers slash 3 mana instant at common costs 2 less to cast if it's night and it deals 3 damage to any target. So probably going to be the best red common is my guess. Just uh, very efficient, especially at night but even during the day it's a fine removal spell, so this will get a B. Moonveil Regent, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four Dragonet Mythic, it flies. Whenever you cast a spell you may discard your hand. If you do, draw a card for each of that spell's colors. So let's just pause for a second right there. So 4-4 four, four Flyer for 4, already incredibly efficient, and would probably get like a B. But this ability is 
incredibly powerful because if we're empty handed, it doesn't matter what type of spell we're casting, at the very least we're drawing an extra card since we discard our hand, doesn't matter because it's empty anyways, and then we get to draw a card if we're casting a multicolor spell even better, but for the most part it's probably going to be just a, a single card that we're drawing. So yeah, sign me up, a card that rewards me for emptying my hands in a color that tends to be aggressive. And then there's more, when the region dies it deals X damage to any target where X is the number of colors among permanents we control. Realistically it's only going to be two, but it's still, you know, two free damage essentially. So if the opponent doesn't deal with the region right away it's just gonna snowball a ton of card advantage. Even if they do get rid of the regent right away, they're usually going to take at least two damage and uh, potentially lose the creature in the process. So the regent has kind of all the uh, properties of a, an S-level card where it's going to easily snowball the game in your favor and even if it's dealt with, which is not trivial, it will still leave its mark on the game. Mounted Dread Knights is 5 mana for a 5 for Vampire Knight at common, it tramples, and Mounted Dread Knight enters the battlefield with a plus 1 counter on it if an opponent lost life this turn. So 5 for Trampler for 5, eh, playable card, not exciting. 6 5 Trampler for 5, quite good. So yeah, just gonna make sure to enable it, and this will be an excellent curve topper for an aggressive vampire deck. So C plus for the Dread Knight. Neonate's Rush is a 3 mana instant at common, costs 1 less to cast if you control a vampire, which you hopefully do, and then the Rush deals 1 damage to target creature and 1 damage to its controller, and you draw a card. There's not that many 1 toughness creatures that you can really punish with the Neonate's Rush, I guess most of them are opposing vampires that we've uh, covered so far. So potentially a nice card in the mirror match. And dealing one damage to the opponent could also be relevant if you have some of those vampires that uh, count on you dealing damage to the opponent. And then if we can cast this for two mana, it's still realistic to cast another one of those cards in the same turn. And it can trips, so you know it's potentially taking out an opposing creature while drawing a card. Best case scenario. So not a bad card. Um, if it's not killing a creature then it's kind of a clunky cantrip that maybe isn't really worth your time, but I think C is still appropriate for the Neonate's Rush. Obsessive Astronomer, 2 mana 2-2 two, two Human Wizard at Uncommon. If it's neither day or night it becomes day, and when it transforms between day and night we can discard up to 2 cards and then draw that many cards. So lots of card filtering, thanks to the Astronomer, can uh, potentially fill our graveyard with flashback cards or just get rid of lands we don't need. And it's all stapled onto a 2 mana 2-2, two, two. that's uh, you know a fine card to play early that can provide some utility in the late game, so it has the makings of a C+. Pax Betrayal is a 3 mana sorcery at common, the act of treason of the set, get to gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn. If we control a wolf or werewolf we also get to scry 2, although I imagine Pax Betrayal is going to be at its best in a black red deck that has some uh, sacrifice effects so we can sacrifice the stolen creature. Um, now if there's not as many great sacrifice outlets, especially in Black Rats, as there were in Forgotten Realms, so I don't think this card's going to be as oppressive as the uh, Sack and Steel deck was in uh, Forgotten Realms, just because there's no Sepulchre Ghoul at 2 mana that sacrifices stuff for free. But that being said, at common we do have Eaten Alive, which for 1 mana can sacrifice a creature and kill something, so that's going to be the main combo with Pax Betrayal, and uh, there's potentially some other ones um, that are a bit more expensive. But uh, yeah, in in a black red vampire deck that has a few sacrifice outlets, this could be 
a relatively powerful card outside of it probably not super interested in Pank's Betrayal so we'll give it a C Play with Fire is a strictly better shock, 1 mana instant and uncommon, dealing 2 damage to any target. And if a player is dealt to damage this way, we also get to scry 1. Just a marginal upside, but a relevant one. In Limited, we're usually more interested in killing creatures with our 2 damage, but occasionally we'll go face. So C plus for Play with Fire, nice cheap burn spell. Purifying Dragon, 5 mana, Dragon and Uncommon, it's a 4-3 flyer, and when the dragon attacks it deals 1 damage to target creature defending player controls, if that creature is a zombie it deals 2 damage instead, so perfect for taking out those decayed zombie tokens. And uh, yeah, overall there's a lot to like about Purifying Dragon, plays well with the red-white rare that increases our damage output, plays well with other burn spells to maybe take out a slightly bigger creature that we otherwise wouldn't be able to take out. 4-3 for 5, you know, maybe a little bit smaller than we would hope for, but still not embarrassing, so I think this gets a B. Raise the Effigy, 1 mana instant at common, can either destroy target artifact or target attacking creature gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So. A somewhat conditional pump spell that only works on offense, but hopefully we're the aggressor anyway, and then has a little bit of extra upside being able to destroy artifacts. So gets a C, fine pump spell. Then a Reckless Stormseeker is quite a card, a 3 mana human werewolf at rare, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature you control gets plus 1 plus 0 and gains haste until end of turn, can also target itself so can turn into a 3-3 haste essentially. Now this is the daybound side, gets even better when it turns to night as we get a storm charged slasher a 3-4 which at the beginning of combat gives target creature we control plus 2 plus 0, trample and haste until end of turn. Yeah this card seems pretty busted, even just the front half would be great but the werewolf side is just uh, pretty ridiculous. So easily an A bomb level card. Seize the Storm is a 5 mana sorcery at uncommon that creates a red elemental creature token with trample and this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard plus the number of cards with flashback you own in exile and has flashback itself for 7 mana. So this is a card that only goes into one deck, which is a blue-red spells deck, presumably, that will try to do its best to fill its graveyard with lots of cheap instants and sorceries, and then Seize the Storm not only enables cards that care about instants and sorceries, but also gives you a win condition while being a sorcery that you also get to flashback. Uh, outside of blue-red spells, this card's not playable. In blue-red spells this card could be great, given that you have enough ways to enable it. So this is where having a ton of those 1 and 2 mana spells is going to be important. Cards like Consider are incredibly powerful alongside Seize the Storm. Now is this an incentive to play that uh, otherworldly gaze in blue, the 1 mana? instant that potentially lets you put three cards in graveyard with flashback, that I'm not sure of, so this is potentially an incentive for all those cheap cards that you otherwise wouldn't really want. But yeah, this is definitely one of those cards that you should be able to get as a blue-red spells deck since no one else wants it, and uh, yeah, could end up being a B-level card once you cast it with enough fuel in the graveyard but uh, I don't think I can give this a B rating uh, on average since I wouldn't necessarily want to like first pick this out of a pack. But once I'm already blue-red, this should be a pretty sweet build-around card. So overall, we'll give this a C, but uh, yeah, definitely a powerful build-around option. Smoldering Egg, 2 mana, 0-4, Dragon Egg and Rare with Defender. 
saying whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a number of ember counters on the smoldering egg equal to the amount of mana spent to cast that spell, then if it has seven or more ember counters on it, remove them and transform smoldering egg into ashmouth dragon, four for dragon with flying, saying whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, dragon deals two damage to any target. So it can even go after creatures. Yeah, Dragon Egg seems pretty busted in probably again the blue red spells deck. Can't imagine too many other decks that can make a good use of this, but uh, definitely a bomb level card in blue red spells. Spell Rune Painter, 3 mana, 2 3 human shaman werewolf add on common. Whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, the painter gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So fake prowess doesn't trigger off enchantments, for instance. This is a day bounce side. The night bounce side is spell rune howler, a three four that gets plus two plus two whenever we cast an instant or sorcery. So this very quickly gets out of hand. And this is all just for a, a three drop. So just takes a couple spells before the opponent's dead. Now, of course, it's not always going to be night time, and uh, if it takes passing the turn before it's night time, then we're not attacking necessarily with the uh, daybound side to begin with, and the opponent can always switch it back. But in the meantime, we maybe get the spell rune howler on defense alongside a grip of uh, instance to pump it up, so it will play defense for a turn nicely as well. So yeah, overall, this seems like another great card for the blue-red spells deck. Outside of it, it's probably still playable, but uh, gonna shine in a deck with lots of cheap instants and sorceries, of course. Stolen Vitality, 2 mana instant at common, saying target creature gets plus 3 plus 1 until end of turn. If it's your turn, it also gains Trample. If it's not, you gain First Strike instead. Trample's a, a nice ability when you're the beatdown. Now, this is probably worse than Sure Strike, which is just plus 3 plus 0 and First Strike all the time, since even on offense, getting that First Strike means it's easier for your creature to survive. Every now and then, of course, Trample could be better to get those last points of damage in. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still just a combo trick. You might want one of these if you're an aggressive creature deck, but don't overdo it. So just to see. Sunstreak Phoenix, 4 mana for a 4-2 Phoenix at Mythic. It flies. If it's neither day or night, it becomes day. And whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, you may pay 1 and a red. If you do, return the Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Well, this card seems pretty great. 4-2 uh, Flyer will eventually end the game. If the opponent kills it, they better have exile based removal, otherwise it's just going to keep coming back. And uh, yeah, this seems pretty difficult for the opponent to stop, and it's only two mana to get it back from the graveyard. Now of course, switching from night to day or day to night, not always trivial, easier to switch from daytime to nighttime since you just pass a turn and do nothing, and then you get your phoenix back. It does come into play tapped, so it doesn't block the turn you get it back. That being said, still seems like an absolute nightmare for the opponent to deal with, and there's not that many clean answers for it. Uh, there's the Eaten Life at common in black, which exiles, and then there's the red 5 mana, 5 damage that also exiles, those come to mind. And then I guess white has some enchantments that could deal with it. But uh, yeah, still definitely a headache for the opponent. Even if it's being enchanted by some aura, you could still kill your own phoenix to eventually get it back. And a 4-2 does tend to either trade for opposing flyers or just deal for damage. There's not many flyers that can profitably block this. So all this to basically say I think this is an S. I think uh, it just has enough recursion built in and 4 mana 4 2 flyer is probably efficient enough in a color that wants to be attacking that uh, this will join the dragon as another 4 mana flyer at mythic that gets an S. 
Tavern Ruffian, 4 mana, 2 5, Human Warrior, Werewolf at common. This is the Daybound side, the Nightbound side is a 6 5 Tavern Smasher. So, yeah, pretty straightforward card. A fine blocker during the day, an amazing attacker when it turns to nighttime. So this is the type of card you wouldn't mind giving Trample to, and uh, yeah, gets a C+. Thermal Alchemist, 2 mana, 03 Human Shaman at Uncommon, has Defender, can tap to deal 1 damage to each opponent, and whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, untap Thermal Alchemist. So, of course, gonna be great in a blue-red spells deck, where we can cast lots of cheap spells to untap it, but I think this is also going to be great in Black Red, where your vampires kind of rely on you dealing damage to the opponents, and Thermal Alchemist is a perfect way to do that without needing to put your creatures in harm's way. So I think this goes as far as a B, whereas typically I would maybe shy more towards C+. But uh, yeah, both being awesome in Blue Red spells and being a great enabler for Black Red, I think bumps it up to a B. Village Watch is a 5 mana 4 3 human werewolf at uncommon. Has haste. This is a daybound side. During the night, they turn into Village Reavers, a 5 4, giving wolves and werewolves we control haste. That also includes itself, so it also has haste itself. And uh, yeah, seems like a great card. C plus at the very least. Voldaren Ambusher is a 3 mana 2 2 vampire archer and uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, it deals X damage to up to 1 target creature or planeswalker, where X is the number of vampires we control. And that also includes itself. So, yeah, realistically, it can probably deal 2 or 3 damage and take out an opposing creature while adding a 2 2 to the board. And, uh,. Yeah, that seems a pretty good deal for 3 mana, so C plus it is. Voldaren Stinger is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one Vampire Warrior at common, has first strike as long as it's attacking, and for 2 and a red it gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So the threat of activation here, incredibly relevant, turning into a 3 powered first striker starting as soon as turn 3, means that... Uh, yeah, the opponent will often be just taking the one damage since they don't want to put their creatures in harm's way. And that's the perfect way to enable your other vampire synergies that require you dealing damage. So incredibly important for the vampire deck, which doesn't have a lot of other one drops to choose from. But uh, this one also happens to just be good by itself. C+. Plus. First, the green cards is a very powerful one, Augur of Autumn. A 3 mana, 2 3 human druid and rare. Says you may look at the top card of your library at any time and play lands from the top of your library. So, a steady stream of card advantage right there. And there's more. With Coven, as long as you have 3 or more creatures with different powers, you may cast creature spells from the top of your library as well. So, this card's pretty ridiculous if it sticks around, especially with Coven enabled going to be at its best in a creature heavy deck so thinking red green werewolves uh, could probably be fine in green white I mean going to be great in any green deck really but uh, even better in decks filled to the brim with creatures as then creatures and lands will make up almost the entirety of your deck and you can just kind of combo off so an easy bomb level card gets an A Bird Admirer is a 3 mana 1 4 human archer werewolf at common with reach during the day. During the night, it turns into Wing Shredder, a 3 5 with reach instead. So, pretty good deal for 3 mana. Green often struggles with flyers, so having a solid creature with reach at common is important. And this one definitely delivers, so we'll give it a C. Plus. Bounding Wolf, 3 mana, 3 2 Wolf with Flash and Reach. So, having Flash in green specifically is a lot more important than it might seem, because you might want to just pass the turn to turn your creatures into their Knights Bound uh, sides, and then still having something to do in the opponent's turn 
is important and in this case we get to add a 3-2 reach to the board. Not an incredibly impressive stat line by any means. It is still a wolf, there's a couple wolf synergies in the set, but again mostly interested because of flash. And then flash plus reach also means we can potentially ambush an opposing flying creature even if the opponent uh, doesn't expect it. So not an incredibly high pick by any means, but still a, a pretty important role player I think in red green werewolves specifically. So I'll go with a C, but uh, a nice card for sure. Bramble armor, two mana equipment at common. As it enters the battlefield, we get to attach it to a creature we control right away, giving it plus two plus one. But then the equip cost is a little bit expensive at four mana. So yeah, playable card, not excited by it since the equip cost is a little bit prohibitive, so you better not uh, lose the creature that's equipped, which sort of defeats the purpose of equipment in the first place, but does give us a mana sink in a late game. And mana sinks in a late game that don't require us casting spells is another way for us to transform daytime into nighttime while still using our mana in an efficient way. So we'll give this a C. Briar Bridge Tracker, 3 mana, 2, 3 human scouted rare, has vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield, investigate. So we immediately get a clue token, so even if the tracker dies, we still get to eventually draw a card. And as long as we control a token, the tracker gets plus 2, plus 0. So the clue token itself means this will be a 4-3 vigilance when it enters the battlefield. Once we sag the clue, if we don't have another token, it shrinks back down. But there's no shortage of other tokens in the set. So I think the tracker gets an A, just a very efficient creature on curve. And even if dealt with, we'll still leave behind a bit of card advantage. A Brood Weaver is a 4 mana 2 4 spider at uncommon with reach. And when the Weaver dies, it creates a 1 2 green spider creature token with reach. So, giant spider that when it dies leaves behind a baby spider. Yeah, seems pretty solid. C. Burly Breaker, 5 mana for a 6 5 human werewolf at uncommon with a war to 1 during the day, during the night. Dyer's Train Demolisher is an 8-7 with Ward 3. This card is just huge, and uh, while it doesn't have any built-in evasion, it just hits incredibly hard. So this is the type of card that will punish anyone that uh, lets it become nighttime without uh, removing this. So B seems appropriate. Candlelit Cavalry, 5 mana for a 5-5 Human Knight at common with Coven, which will give it Trample until end of turn. Yeah, fine cards, um, probably closer to a uh, C plus than a C, but could go either way. Clear Shots, uh, 3 mana instant, add on common, giving target creature we control plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature we don't control. Being an instant, again, relevant if you want to transform to nighttime, and then you still get to make use of a nice removal spell. And then uh, dealing damage, a lot better than fighting, of course. And then the plus one plus one makes it easier to win the fight. So, yeah, nothing to remark here, just uh, an easy B. Great removal spell. Consuming Blob is a 5 mana Mythic Rare Ooze, and its power is equal to the number of card types among cards in our graveyard, and its toughness is equal to that number plus 1. So reminiscent of uh, Tarmogoyf, now it doesn't check the opponent's graveyard, that's the main difference. So card types include creatures, instants, sorceries, lands, enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, uh, not sure if there's any other ones in the set. But uh, yeah, the blob can get pretty large. Now, card types that naturally end up in the graveyard are instant sorceries and creatures. Maybe an artifact on occasion. Uh, lands require some sort of self-mill before they get there. Yeah, we can count on the blob being like a 3-4 under most circumstances if your deck is somewhat uh, balanced. But if you're actively self-milling, it could get even bigger. And then at the beginning of your end step, create a green ooze creature token 
and this creature's powers equal to the number of card types among cards in your graveyard, and toughness is equal to the number plus one. So every end step we get to make an extra ooze. Now the ooze token doesn't have this ability, but the consuming blob does, so they need to deal with the blob itself, and uh, at the very least, unless the opponent has instant speed removal waiting for it, you'll get to one extra token. And yeah, if the blob's not dealt with right away, it's just gonna keep making more and more. Now, if the blobs are like one twos, then the opponent can maybe still deal with them. If the blobs are three fours, then it's a whole different story. So it will, of course, vary based on how good you are at uh, filling the graveyard with those different card types. Probably gonna be at its best in like a blue green deck with some self mill, maybe black green. Um, but nevertheless gets an S, just a, a card that needs an immediate answer, even if it gets answered, still leaves something behind. It's an S that probably varies still based on your deck composition. It's not an S that, you know, goes into any green deck and automatically wins the game if you play it, but it's still incredibly powerful. Contortionist Troop is X and a green for a human and uncommon. Enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it and has Coven, in which case we can put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So this card is unexciting unless we have Coven active, since we're usually overpaying for the troop itself, but the ability also makes it so we can keep enabling Coven in the future, since we can kind of spread around the counter somewhat. So once we get Coven going, it should be pretty easy to keep Coven for the foreseeable future, and then this will provide a nice bit of value over time. The only problem is the turn we play the troop, we're kind of playing an overcosted creature, so this is more of a card you want to play in the late game, that way you have Coven uh, the turn you play the troop, so you get that extra plus one counter right away to kind of make up for the the extra mana you paid for it. So yeah, overall C plus for the troop, seems okay. Dawn Heart's Mentor is 3 mana for an 0-4, Human Warlock and Uncommon, and when a Mentor enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token. So great for the green-white token decks, and also has Coven for 6 mana, in which case target creature you control gets plus 3 plus 3 and gains Trample until end of turn, and of course has the Coven requirement. So not a card you're gonna be interested in in your red-green werewolf deck. Probably only a card you want in green-white, where you care about going white, making tokens, having humans, and of course Coven. And in that deck it's probably a C+. Donhart Rejuvenator is a 4-mana 2-4 human warlock at common. When it enters the battlefield you gain 3 life and can tap to add 1 mana of any color. So this is probably at its best in the green-blue deck that can maybe splash additional colors, as this will fix your mana to potentially splash some bombs, but potentially also fine in the green-white as an extra human that can help you ramp. So C plus seems nice. The life gain, just a nice bonus. Death Bonnet Sprout is one mana for a fungus at uncommon. Incredibly cute art. It's a 1-1 one, one that at the beginning of your upkeep lets you mill a card. Then if there are three or more creature cards in your graveyard, transform Death Bonnet Sprout. So it does take a while to get going. And Death Bonnet Hulk is a 3-3 three, three fungus horror that at the beginning of your upkeep you may exile a card from a graveyard, any graveyard, including the opponents. And if a creature card was exiled this way, put a plus one plus one counter on the Hulk. So, yeah, again, Graveyard Hate in a set full of Flashback and Disturb is very relevant. And even if you're not exiling a creature and not getting the counter, it's still potentially worth it to deny Flashback for the opponent. And, uh, yeah, a 3 3 that will keep growing over time seems quite strong. But, of course, the caveat is that it may take a while before the Death Bonnet Sprout grows up all the way. Still easily a C plus. If it was a little easier to transform, it would be even better, but uh, still seems like a great card. 
Defend the Celestus is a 4 mana instant and uncommon, letting us distribute 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters among 1, 2 or 3 target creatures we control. Very flexible, being an instant plays well in the red green werewolf deck where we might pass a turn to turn it into night time and then set up some favorable blocks, who knows. Uh, C plus seems fine here. A Dryad's Revival is a 3 mana sorcery at Uncommon and lets us return a target card from our graveyard to our hand. Also has flashback for 4 and a green. So typically these regrowth effects are quite strong, especially once we get to the late game. And uh, yeah, we even get to do it twice here with the Dryad's Revival. So a ton of value to be had, but uh, yeah, only really a card you're interested in casting in the late game, but uh, yeah, we get to do it twice. So B for Dryad's Revival. Duel for Dominance, 2 mana instant at common. Get to choose target creature we control and target creature we don't control. If we control 3 or more creatures with different powers, aka the Coven requirement, we get to put a plus one plus one counter on the chosen creature we control, and then the chosen creatures fight each other. So two mana, instant speed, fight, and if we have Coven, we also get a plus one counter out of the deal. Pretty straightforward. Uh, fighting, not as good as the uh, clear shot at three mana at Uncommon, but uh, yeah, potentially also getting an extra plus one counter out of the deal is not bad. So still C plus for dual for dominance, but there will be scenarios where your creatures aren't large enough or uh, yeah, you don't have Coven and it's just kind of an overpriced prey upon, although I guess at instant speed. Eccentric Farmer, 3 mana for a 2-3 human peasant at common. When it enters the battlefield, mill 3 cards and then you may return a land card from your graveyard to your hand. So on average, you should be able to hit at least one land in three cards. And uh, in that case, it's a 2-3 that draws a land. So a nice two for one. And at the same time, it also helps you fill the graveyard for various graveyard synergies, maybe flashback. So C plus for farmer seems like a nice two for one. Harvest Tide Sentry has a two mana, three one human warrior at common with coven in which case the sentry cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less at this turn. So a decent 2-drop avoids trading for small stuff, assuming we can enable coven, but a 3-powered creature means that, you know, there's a couple creatures like the 0-powered the creature that makes a 1-1 one -one token plus the sentry and we've got coven and that curves nicely into each other. So doesn't seem too difficult to enable Coven by turn 3 in the right deck. And uh, yeah, in that case, the Sentry can beat down pretty hard. And then at a, a certain point, if you can no longer attack, can still hang back as a 3 power blocker, which can potentially trade up for bigger stuff. So C plus for Sentry. Seems like a fine role player in the green-white Coven deck. Outside of it, it's probably not as exciting. Hound Tamer. 3 mana, 3-3 three, three human werewolf at uncommon, it tramples, and for 4 mana we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. This is a great activated ability, and just the threat of activation is also very relevant, we don't have to use it. They kind of have to assume that we can always have one extra power and toughness, making blocking and attacking pretty difficult. Activated ability also works well with enabling your werewolves, as we can pass a turn, let it flip to nighttime, and then we get the untamed pup, which still has the same activated ability, but is now a 4 4 trampler, giving other wolves and werewolves we control trample. So, great card, awesome activated ability, easy B, and a very high B at that. Howl of the Hunts, 3 mana, enchantment aura at common with flash. Enchanting a creature, and when the Howl of the Hunt enters the battlefield, if enchanted creature is a wolf or werewolf, untap that creature, giving it plus two plus two and vigilance. This card is pretty awesome in a red green werewolf deck. Pass a turn, let it turn to night, all your creatures get bigger, opponent tries to attack back, 
flash this in, untap your large werewolf, gets plus two plus two. And then now you've got an enormous werewolf that has the additional plus two plus two and vigilance. So under the right circumstances, this is a complete blowout. Now there will be situations where opponent untaps, attacks with their creature, you try and ambush, they have instant speed removal in response. That will happen, so it's not always going to be that easy. But uh, a card with a lot of potential, and specifically in red-green werewolves, a card I'm uh, pretty keen to try out. So we'll start with a C+, but uh, probably only a card you want in a more dedicated werewolf deck. Might of the Old Ways is a 2-mana instance at common, giving a creature plus 2 plus 2. And if we have Coven, after getting plus 2 plus 2, if we have those three creatures with different powers, we also get to draw a card. So you only check for it after giving plus two plus two. Yeah, nice combo trick. Uh, it only gives plus two plus two for two mana, which, you know, we typically expect to only pay one mana for that effect, but has the potential of drawing a card. So overall on the balance, probably still just a C, but a card that will be pretty nice in the more dedicated Coven decks. Outland, a Liberator, a 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, Human Werewolf, and Uncommon. For 1 mana we can sacrifice a Liberator to destroy target artifact or enchantment. So we get a nice naturalize effect stapled onto a fine 2-drop, which can even turn into a Werewolf, in which case it's going to be a 3-3 three, three with the same ability. And on top of that, when the Frenzied Trap Breaker attacks, destroy target artifact or enchantment defending player controls. So we don't even have to sacrifice a Trap Breaker to deal with artifacts or enchantments. Now there's not a ton of artifacts and enchantments to begin with in the set, but it's just pure upside on a creature that's already quite good, so easily a C+. Path to the Festival is a 3 mana sorcery at common, lets us search our library for a basic land to put on the battlefield tapped. Then if there are 3 or more basic land types among lands we control, we also get to scry 1, and it has flashback for 4 and a green. A ton of value, yet I'm still not compelled to give it more than a C, just because the multicolor, you know, three color deck doesn't seem very pushed. Like blue green is probably the color pair that might wanna splash and dabble into a third color. But uh, outside of it, I don't really see the use of Path to the Festival too much. Uh, sure, flashback is nice, but by the time you're flashing this back, unless you've got some 8 mana cards to cast, you probably don't need it, so a bit slow and dirtily, but uh, still seems like a, a fun way to splash a third color in that blue-green deck, so we'll give it a C. Pestilent Wolf, 2 mana for a 2-2 wolf at common, and for 2 and a green it can gain death touch until end of turn. Yeah, this is a great example of a nice 2-drop with late-game utility. Can be an early board presence to attack and block with, and then once it gets to the late game, it can even hold off the biggest of uh, wolves or werewolves from the opponent. So C plus for Pestilent Wolf. Plummet is back, 2 mana instant, that goes usually in our sideboard to destroy target creature with flying. Don't think we're main decking this, and uh, yeah, gonna be a very useful sideboard card, so we'll give it a D for now. Primal Adversary is going to complete the cycle of adversaries. 3 mana, 4, 3 wolf and mythic. It tramples, so already for 3 trampler for 3 is above the curve. Would probably get like a B grade, but uh, there's more. When the adversary enters the battlefield, you may pay 1 and a green any number of times. And when we pay this cost 1 or more times, put that many plus 1 plus 1 counters on Primal Adversary and then up to that many target lands you control become 3-3 three, three wolf creatures with haste that are still lands. 4-3 for three, four, 3 is fine, not exciting. 5 mana, 5-4 five, with trample that turns one of our lands into a 3-3. Three, three. Pretty decent, the 3-3 three, three can attack right away, although we don't get to untap the land, so I guess we need one additional land before it actually gets to attack right away. But uh, yeah, once we get to 7 mana, having a 6-5 a Trampler that makes 6 additional power and toughness 
and uh, can potentially attack with some of those lands right away. So it does represent a lot of haste damage in the very late game if we have a lot of mana. But uh, yeah, more realistically, we're just going to try and cast this for as much mana as possible, even if that means some of those lands will be tapped. But uh, yeah, Adversary seems like a bomb. Maybe not quite as tier uh, as the white Adversary, but easily an A-level card. Then we've got Return to Nature as another reprint to Mana Instant that can destroy an artifact, enchantment or exile target card from a graveyard at common. Probably just a sideboard card, even though I like the ability to exile cards from graveyards, I much prefer it if they're stapled onto some sort of creature and an attack trigger or an ETB effect. I don't really want to spend an entire card to take away a flashback card or one of the disturb cards from my opponent. So D for Return to Nature. Then Rise of the Ants, 6 mana for a sorcery at uncommon that creates two 3-3 three, three green insect creature tokens and you gain two life. So not a bad deal. Two 3-3 three, three tokens are unlikely to make any profitable attacks but they're good at blocking and I imagine the deck that once Rise of the Ants is going to be the blue-green kind of dirtle flashback deck that is interested in ramping a little bit, playing defense, flashing back a bunch of cards, and in this case we can flash back Rise of the Ants for 8 mana, make a couple more insects, gain more life. Seems like a very fun deck. Still not an amazing card by any means, probably still just a C+, but in the blue-green flashback dirtle deck I'm going to be pretty happy with Rise of the Ants as a way to stall out the board. And then hopefully you've got the skies covered with reach creatures and you can eventually figure out a way to win the game. Then we've got Sarith the Viper's Fang, 4 mana for a 3-4 legendary human warlock and rare, saying other tapped creatures you control have death touch, other untapped creatures you control have hexproof, and for 1 mana we can tap Sarith to untap another target creature or land we control. So. If one of our valuable creatures was tapped, we get to protect it by untapping it and giving it hexproof. And the fact that our tapped creatures have death touch means all our attacking creatures essentially have death touch, making it very difficult for the opponent to block. So yeah, Sarith seems pretty great and uh, gets an A for me, bomb level card. Shadow Beast Sighting is a 4 mana sorcery at common, creating a 4 4 green beast creature token. So great stats for a common, and there's more. Has flashback for 7 mana. So this card seems pretty sweet. Now, the one downside is bounce spells. If the opponent has one of those cheap bounce spells in blue, they can uh, deal with our 4 4 token quite easily, and we're gonna feel bad about it. But uh, yeah, another great card for the uh, blue-green Dirtle deck that tries to flash back a bunch of cards, but also a fine card in any green deck as a 4-mana four 4-4 four four is a pretty good stat line. So this might creep its way into the B range. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go for it. Shadow Beast Siding gets a B. Snarling Wolf, 1-mana for a 1-1 one one wolf at common. And for one and a green, the Snarling Wolf gets plus two plus two until end of turn. Can only be activated once each turn. So as much as I liked the uh, Red's One Drop Vampire, I don't love the Snarling Wolf as much. Part of it is that the archetype that it goes in, presumably Red Green Werewolves, just doesn't need a one drop as much. It doesn't have cards that need you to deal damage before they are worth including. That being said, an activated ability on a wolf is still potentially a nice way for your wolves to transform into their uh, knight side, since you still get to use your mana efficiently and uh, get in some extra damage. But yeah, I'm, I'm not super excited about Snarling Wolf. Still seems playable if you're short on playables. This seems like a, a filler card, but uh, yeah, not really excited about it, so... Probably just to see. Then we've got Storm the Festival, 6 mana, sorcery at rare. 
lets you look at the top five cards of your library and put up to two permanent cards with mana value five or less from among them onto the battlefield and put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So reminiscent of Collected Company, but this can find permanents, not only creatures, and instead of three or less, it's five or less. And then also has flashback for 10 mana, so pretty pricey. Yeah, this card feels like it, uh, on average, is probably gonna disappoint only getting to look at the top five cards. But it, of course, has potential if we get the the jackpots of hitting two five drops. We get 10 mana worth of cards for six mana. It's also sorcery instead of an instant, so it's not gonna surprise the opponent. But um, yeah, also has flashback, so probably goes well in the blue-green flashback deck I'm alluding to. At the end of the day, probably still give it a C+, plus, since it has potential to be a powerful two-for-one, but uh, doesn't dig super deep and uh, your deck can only have so many expensive cards, so it's not going to be filled to the brim with five drops to hit with Storm to Festival, otherwise the deck's probably not functional. Tapping at the window has a two mana sorcery at common, lets you look at the top three cards of your library, and you may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. The rest goes into your graveyard. Going into the graveyard definitely better than bottom of your library in this set, but only looking at three cards to find a creature, you're not always going to find a creature, sadly. So the, the numbers just aren't necessarily in your favor. Uh, it does have flashback for two and a green, but at that point we're spending a lot of mana kind of spinning our wheels and not necessarily getting a whole lot of creatures in our hand. Maybe in a deck that is desperate to fill his graveyard to enable some synergies. This could be worth it. Maybe you've got a bomb like the Consuming Blob that you want to find at all costs, and this will help fill the graveyard at the same time. I could see it, but uh, I think on average this still gets a D and a card you should avoid. Timberland Guide is back, reprinted as well. Two mana, one one human scout at common. When it enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature. So. These types of cards used to be exciting. A 2 mana 1 1 that puts a counter somewhere. Could be a 2 mana 2 2, but maybe the counter is better somewhere else. Nowadays, these cards are just average since we're kind of used to them. And does have the upside of enabling Coven nicely. Since we get potentially a 1 1 that increases our power somewhere else. Or, you know, a 2 2 if it has to be a 2 2. So it's probably a fine curve filler in the coven decks but nothing more than uh, a filler card i don't think this gets to the c plus where sometimes these types of cards would make it to a c plus then we've got tireless hauler five mana for a four five human werewolf at common with vigilance this is the daybound side and the nightbound side is a dire strain brawler a six six with vigilance vigilance incredibly important allowing us to play offense and defense. Yeah, this is a beast of a card and easily gets at least a C plus. And, oh boy, Tovalar's Huntmaster. Six mana for a 6-6 six, six human werewolf at rare. When it enters the battlefield, create two 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens. So we're getting 10 power and toughness when it enters the battlefield. This is the daybound side. If it happens to be night, we get Tovalar's pack leader instead. Still generates a pair of wolf tokens, but not only when it enters a battlefield, also when it attacks. So let that sink in. A 7-7 seven, seven that generates two wolf tokens and generates another pair of wolf tokens when it attacks. But wait, there's more for four mana. Another target to wolf or werewolf you control fights target creature you don't control. Yeah, this card's pretty busted. And sadly, it's a rare, so you're gonna see it if you like it or not. Turn the earth one mana instant at uncommon. Choose up to three target cards in graveyards. The owners of those cards shuffle them into their libraries and you gain two life. 
has flashback for one and a green. As much as I like Graveyard Hates, I don't want to spend the cards casting my Graveyard Hates. I want to have it stapled onto something else. So this is a D. Unnatural Growth is 5 mana, 1 and quadruple green for a rare enchantment saying at the beginning of each combat, double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. Now I like the text on the card that doubles my power and toughness. Not so much a fan of the casting costs which is for green mana symbols. So this essentially limits it to a mono green deck and in limited these days we're very rarely incentivized to go mono green or mono colored. So if you can pull it off, maybe you're like heavily green in pack one, maybe speculating on a second color, you open this in pack two or get past to it. Maybe try to go mono green, who knows. But uh, yeah, it's not a card I would actively aim to build around since you're probably better off playing two colors. So unnatural growth gets a D. Willow Geist, 1 mana for a 1 1 Tree Folk Spirit. At rare, it tramples, and whenever one or more cards leave your graveyard, put a plus one plus one counter on Willow Geist, and when the Geist dies, you gain life equal to its power. So, an unassuming little 1 drop um, in a slot that there's not a whole lot of competition, to be fair. Yeah, seems okay, especially in like a blue green flashback deck that can easily cast a bunch of cards out of the graveyard. Still not an exciting card, so probably a C at most. And if you don't have any graveyard synergies, of course, this doesn't have a place in your deck. Ren and seven, five mana Planeswalker starts out at five loyalty. The plus one reveals the top four cards of your library. Put all land cards revealed this way into your hand. The rest goes into your graveyard. I think this is essentially mulch. Then for zero mana, put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. Potentially useful if you found a bunch of lands of the plus one. But what we're most interested in is the minus three. Create a green tree folk creature token with reach, and this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. Assuming we play Renan 7 on turn 5, we minus 3, make a 5 5 tree folk token with reach. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. Protects our planeswalker so we can keep plussing and filling the graveyard more, getting more value, and hopefully eventually making another tree folk. I don't think the minus eight is gonna be relevant since we're probably gonna make tree folk tokens instead. But if we get there, return all permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand, and you get an emblem saying you have no maximum hand size. So it can I guess be relevant if uh, you milled your entire deck but you gotta watch out for decking if you use the plus one too many times. So yeah, for limiteds, I think this is just gonna be make a tree folk, get some lands, fill the graveyard, make another tree folk, and you're probably gonna be satisfied. So I don't think this quite bumps up to an S, because it's not impossible for the opponent to, you know, kill your tree folk and finish off Ren. But uh, yeah, if you get to keep Ren 7 around for a while. Green has a lot of ways to make use of the graveyard between flashback and maybe your second color has a few disturb cards as well. So I think this is an A, probably not quite an S, but uh, it definitely will be a nice planeswalker to play with. First artifact is the Celestus, a three mana legendary artifact at rare. And if it's in neither day or night, it turns to day as it enters the battlefield. Can tap to add one mana of any color. And for three mana, we can tap it and switch nighttime to daytime or vice versa. And whenever it transforms from day to night or the other way around, we get to gain one life. And then we may draw a card if we do discard a card. So an interesting little trinket that... Uh, yeah, helps us ramp, helps us loot, has a bit of agency over daytime and nighttime. So a bunch of useful abilities. Still not a card I'm super thrilled about, but uh, seems playable, especially in the blue-green multicolor deck that might want a mana fixing. I'll give it a C. 
Crossroads Candle Guide for mana 3-4 Scarecrow at common. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. Nice ability, although don't know if I want it attached to a 4 mana 3-4 is a problem. And then for 2 mana we can add 1 mana of any color, so does a bit of uh, mana filtering at uh, a pretty expensive rate. Yeah, this is probably a D. Not a card I'm excited to play, but if we're desperate for playables, this will do. Jackal Lantern, 1 mana artifact at common. For 1 mana we can tap and sacrifice a lantern and exile up to 1 target card from a graveyard and draw a card. So, nice little cantrip that replaces itself while exiling a card from the opponent. And then we can also pay 1 mana and exile the lantern from our graveyard to add 1 mana of any color. So we can do the whole mana filtering out of the graveyard. So the main use for Jack or Lantern is either as the graveyard hate out of the sideboard, or let's say you have the consuming blob in uh, your green deck. This is a way to potentially put an artifact into the graveyard easily and get an extra card type. So that's probably the extent of it. I don't think we're main decking Jack or Lantern unless uh, it turns out that having that little bit of graveyard disruption is key, but I doubt it. So we'll give Jackal Lantern a D, but uh, don't be afraid to sign it in. Moonsilver Key, 2 mana artifact at uncommon. For 1 mana we can tap and sacrifice it to search your library for an artifact card with a mana ability or a basic land card. Reveal it and put it into your hand. Not really interested. Give it a D. Mystic Skulls, a 2 mana artifact at uncommon, can pay 1 mana, tap it and add 1 mana of any color, so filters or mana, or we can pay 5 mana, tap it and transform Mystic Skull. Now it will be tapped when it transforms, so we'll have a tapped 5-6 Mystic Monstrosity, saying lands we control can add 1 mana of any color when they tap. So gives us perfect mana fixing, and we get a 5-6. So the redeeming quality of Mystic Monstrosity and Mystic Skull is that it probably plays well in like a red-green werewolf style of deck where the turn you want your werewolves to transform, you can simply transform your Mystic Skull and still spend your mana in a useful manner. But I'm still not excited about it, so yeah, this is probably still just a D. Pithing Needle, reprinted, just a card for constructed applications. Uh, even if the opponent has some powerful activated abilities, you need to play Pithing Needle preemptively in order to stop them. And the opponent might not even draw the card you're afraid of if you're playing sideboarded games. Even against a Planeswalker, you would have to play this preemptively since most Planeswalkers get a lot of value from their first minus activation, so... Yeah, this is just an F. Silver Bolt is actually pretty decent, a 1 mana artifact at common. And for 3 mana we can tap and sacrifice it to deal 3 damage to target creature. And if a werewolf is dealt damage this way, destroy it. So we've talked about how the removal in the set is a little bit lackluster, especially in kind of the non-black and red colors. And Silverbolt gives you a great answer to some of those large werewolves and that common, and any deck can play this. So I think Silverbolt's going to be a very solid role player in a lot of different decks. And uh, the rate's pretty efficient, can play it on turn one when you're not doing anything else. And then three mana for three damage is uh, a pretty decent rate. And then destroying any werewolf, no matter how big they are, seems like a great deal. So... C plus at the very least. I could even see it moving up. Seems like a, a very solid artifact that uh, will make a lot of decks. Then a Stuffed Bear, 2 mana artifact at common. And for 2 mana, the Stuffed Bear becomes a 4 4 green bear artifact creature token until end of turn. Again, a card that could be okay in a werewolf deck as a mana sink to turn day into night. Still spending a lot of mana on a creature that's only sometimes a creature. I'm not convinced by it, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it's effective when played against me. 
presumably out of a red-green werewolf deck. Still gonna give it a D for now. And then we're on to the lands. There's a cycle of dual lands that enters the battlefield untapped if we have two or more other lands in play. So these are all pretty decent. Then we also have Evolving Wilds, which, again, nice bit of mana fixing. Even fine to play in any two-color deck, because mana bases and limited are usually pretty bad. So any mana base can benefit from one or two copies of Evolving Wilds. And this is also a nice way to put a land in the graveyard for cards that care about it. So C plus for Evolving Wilds. And I'll end up giving the Cycle of Dual Lands a C plus as well. Field of Rune, on the other hand, probably doesn't... Uh, need to see a lot of play, and uh, there's not a lot of lands that require destroying, but will be a solid reprint for standard. But for limited, this is a D. And then again, the cycle of dual lands will give a C+. Hostile, Hostile is a mythic rare land, taps for colorless, and for one mana we can tap it, sacrifice a creature, and put a soul counter on hostile hostile. Then if there are three or more soul counters on it, get to remove those counters and transform it and untap it, in which case it turns into creeping in a 3-7 artifact creature horror construct. When creeping in attacks, we may exile a creature card from a graveyard, or our graveyard, and if we do, each opponent loses X life and we gain X life, where X is the number of creature cards exiled with creeping in. And for 4 mana, Creeping In phases out, so we can maybe save it from removal. A pretty cool concept. Card itself seems a little bit slow to get going and asks a lot of you. Sacrificing 3 creatures, maybe in the black-white sacrifice deck or a deck with a lot of decay zombie tokens. But we can only activate this at uh, sorcery speed, so it's not like we can sacrifice a decayed zombie after it's dealt damage. So, yeah, I'm pretty skeptical of the hostile hostel. I don't think I would spend the night, but uh, we'll just give it a D for now. And then once again, the dual land cycle, I'll give the official C plus rating here. All right, and that rounds out our set review for today. So as always, I want to remind you that a spreadsheet with all my up-to-date tier list ratings is available for all patrons and Twitch subscribers in my private Discord server alongside all the other set reviews I've done over time. So make sure to check that out if you're interested. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.